Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the December 16, 2015 Town Council meeting. Uh, if you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Baybine. Present. Councilor Rowan. <coughs> Present. Councilor Katarina. Here. Councilor St. Clair. Here. Councilor Hayes. Here. Councilor Piazzo. Here. Chairman Donovan. Here. Uh, uh, <coughs> general public comment. Uh, uh, anyone wishing to uh, make a comment on any item that is not on our agenda uh, for this evening is welcome to uh, go to the podium. We have posted uh, our rules of decorum uh, uh, there, and I welcome anyone to take the opportunity to read it. Uh, politeness, civility are the watchwords that uh, come to mind. Uh, uh, no personal attacks. Uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, demeanor that we want to have presented uh, by our counselors and by the public who's uh, attending our meeting. And I must say thank you for coming to the meeting. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, very important to uh, our democracy that we have people come, see what's going on, and understand our process. So thank you for coming. Uh, uh, seeing no one uh, for public comment, I will close it. Uh, minutes of December 2, 2015. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, comments, corrections from anyone? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> Adjustments to the agenda, there are none. Uh, items to be signed, uh, the treasurer's warrants, I will sign those later. Takes us to order number 15-97, 7 p.m. public hearing and act to determine whether the residential structure located on land owned by Douglas S. Brown at 9 Partridge Lane, Scarborough, Maine, and identified as map U008-087 of the current Scarborough tax map is dangerous or a nuisance within the meaning of Title 17 MRSA Section 2851 and order any appropriate corrective action. Uh, I will look to uh, the town manager to begin the introduction of this matter. Yes, this matter has been scheduled uh, and uh, notice has been published for public hearing, first and foremost, uh, at which time I encourage you to hear from Brian Longstaff, member of my staff. He's the zoning administrator and the one who's been spearheading this uh, enforcement action for the better part of a year. Um, Brian is distributing materials this evening. Uh, we do have uh, the town attorney, Phil Saucier, in attendance as well to make certain that should there be questions of the council uh, regarding this uh, proceeding. Thank you, Brian. And it is, uh, though scheduled as a public hearing, it really is a quasi judicial proceeding. And so, uh, certainly, the rights of all <coughs> folks involved in the matter need to be respected, due process respected as part of that, of course. And uh, we intend to certainly do that. Um, I've encouraged in, uh, the chair to seek advice from legal counsel to make sure that we follow all the correct steps. Hmm. So, with that quick introduction, um, I certainly would like uh, for you to hear from Brian Longstaff and uh, to provide some uh, commentary and I uh, guess some evidence for your consideration later on. The, uh, before Brian begins, I uh, uh, just want to uh, indicate that uh, this is a hearing. We will be uh, taking essentially evidence. Uh, I also want to disclose that the town public health officer is Steve Kirsch who is married to my wife's daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that will present any conflict on my behalf. Uh, I've never spoken to Mr. Kirsch, Dr. Kirsch, uh, about this matter, but I did want to disclose it and allow everyone to realize uh, that, uh, that connection. Uh, Brian? Great, thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Brian Longstaff. I'm the zoning administrator here in Scarborough. Um, and uh, what I passed out to you were some additional materials um, at the suggestion of the town's attorney, and I agree, it's, I think it's good for you to have those materials. Uh, what you'll find, uh, the very first page kind of goes down through the different exhibits that are there, A through G. 
and uh, recaps what you, I hope, already received in your council packets uh, prior to the meeting. Uh, so that's just for your reference. I'm not going to go through all of those materials tonight. I want to try to be as brief as possible. Um, we do have um, a, m a member of the local police department who was on site uh, who would also like to just recap really quickly what he saw in addition to the testimony that I'm going to give. And, and also the uh, landowner, the property owner, Douglas Brown, is here, so I want to make sure that there's enough time for you folks to hear from him as well. Um, so again, just to recap, <coughs> uh, order number 15-097 is a public hearing and act to determine whether the residential structure that's located there at Nine Partridge um, is a dangerous building. And then if it is, if you do find that it is, what will you do about uh, ordering a corrective action for that? What kind of corrective action is appropriate? So I'm going to try to just, uh, just quickly recap what we, uh, the, kind of in chronological order, um, what has, has occurred there. The property uh, became known to us as a property in, in disrepair Sometime in 2014, I don't know the exact date, um, I had one of the code officers stop by and leave a, a ticket on the uh, doorknob that basically says, we've been by, there, there may be issues with your property, please give us a call. Um, we didn't hear anything. Uh, we tried that a few times. And then finally in March of 2015, I wrote the first notice of violation um, to uh, Mr. Douglas Brown. Um, we were pretty sure he wasn't living at the residence, but we didn't have a current address. We had a work address for Mr. Brown. He is employed by L.L. Bean, so we tried to reach him through L.L. Bean, and, um, and the letters uh, that we sent certified were um, received, and um, we, so we assumed that he was getting letters. I didn't get a, a phone call from him. I didn't get any response from him after three notices. Then, as procedure dictates, we go to the next step, which is final notice, and then we move, uh, and basically the notices, by the way, were just simply to ask for an opportunity to go in and inspect the property to determine what violations, what corrections needed to be made. It was obvious the, the property was in distress. Um, so after the final step of the final notice, we went to uh, the district court with um, uh, an application for administrative warrant uh, to inspect the property. We were granted that warrant. A copy of that is in your packet uh, that I just handed out to you. Um, we, in, in trying to serve Mr. Brown uh, that notice uh, for that warrant, one of the, the uh, deputy sheriff went to the property thinking he might be able to catch Mr. Brown there to serve him the notice. Uh, the odors that were coming from the house were so strong that there was, he was in fear that there might, might be an unattended death in the property, mm -hmm. and that's when the police department and fire department got involved at that point. Um, that was prior to our inspection. Uh, of the property. So uh, I think uh, Officer McNeese will be talking to you about that a little in a little bit. Um, so that really kind of raised our level of concern that we needed to, to get into that property. We were granted the administrative warrant. We conducted the inspection after all proper notices were given. We conducted the inspection on August 13th. Um, in your packets you will find not only my report but the report of the local health officer, uh, Dr. Steve Kirsch. Um, Again, we recognize that it was pretty unlikely no, that anyone was living in the, in the uh, dwelling at the time, but it certainly wasn't habitable in the condition that we found it. Um, there were definitely um, some health issue things that we found there, um, and so we proceeded uh, to re we returned that warrant to the district court with our findings, um, and then I sent uh, Mr. Brown a final uh, letter basically saying that the property was condemned. It was uninhabitable. We posted it as such. Um, and so the process has brought us to basically where we are today. Um, I think in your package you have several photos that kind of give you a general depiction of some of the conditions that were found there. Uh, one of the major issues was that the deck <coughs> back of the building had fallen away, exposing some framing to the weather. That in turn caused some sagging ceiling members and floor joists in the second floor. Um, there was obviously animal intrusion into the structure through attic vents, uh, through, uh, you could see um, on the outside of the building around the perimeter and the base, uh, the siding was gnawed away um, and uh, decayed away so that there was plenty of uh, access for wildlife and pests. So that was one, one issue. Um, the, uh, you know, there was uh, just an accumulation of rubbish and other things in the structure, flies, um, it's all there in the reports, and the pictures kind of tell, tell a pretty good story. 
I think at this point, if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, um, I would probably uh, like to read Dr. Kirsch's report to kind of give you that overview, if that would be all right. So Dr. Kirsch, who, who uh, we were hoping would be able to be here, he couldn't be here because of uh, other commitments, um, basically says, uh, the inspection of the premises was performed August 13th by, by local officer, local health officer Stephen Kirsch. Other individuals present were Chris Kreps, Animal Control, Brian Dobson, Code Enforcement, James Butler, Fire Department, and Brian Longstaff. Conclusion was, based on inspection of said premises, occupancy of these premises is not permitted until con conditions dangerous or detrimental to life or health are corrected. Specifically, removal of filth, human, uh, removal of human waste, removal of decomposing trash, rodents, and other animal excrement, secure living space from wild animals such as raccoons. Uh, posting of premises was performed on August 13, 2015. Written notice will, will uh, need to be provided to owner Douglas Brown and to district court per court order. Uh, the health issues found, again, filth. The internal environment has two floors. Uh, the attached garage was cluttered with belongings and trash, uh, as were the two floors. For example, the kitchen was filled with stacks of pizza boxes, bottles, and belongings. The room between the kitchen and the garage was layered in what appeared to be rodent, rodent excrement. Um, there was an odor of decomposing trash, rodents in both uh, the kitchen and the room between the kitchen and the garage. Refrigerators in the kitchen and room between the garage were not open due to the volume, volume of trash piled against the doors. Um, there was evidence of um, open five-gallon container filled with clear yellow liquid consistent with urine. Um, animal infestation, there were photographic evidence of raccoons living in the attic during the winter. Um, so the recommendations were um, currently conditions on this property warrants the removal of filth and human waste based on statute title 22 MRSA 1561 and title 22 chapter 153. Property was posted with findings at the time of inspection. Appropriate abatement of filth and human waste will be required to put to uh, to be put in proper conditions as to cleanliness. Um, owner will need to be notified. District court will need to be notified. Appropriate measures will be required to secure living space from potential animals due to exposure uh, to animals pose uh, due to the exposure to animals poses potential risk to transmit rabies. Um, and then repeat uh, inspection as per district court order and completion of above order debate. And that was signed Dr. Stephen Kirsch. Um, does anyone have any questions for me at this time? What was your assessment about uh, it constituting a fire hazard? Yeah, the, the accumulations of rubbish and trash are obviously a, a fire hazard. Um, uh, the house was energized at the time that we were in it. Um, we did contact Central Maine Power and have them de-energize the house. Um, I think Mr. Brown had been there to uh, to uh, get rid of the uh, uh, spoiled meat that was causing the odor that the, the police department found, and I think he had the uh, had the fan running and had had the fan, the exhaust fan running in the uh, kitchen for some time. Uh, other than that, there was really no reason to have the house energized, and we were really afraid of potential fire hazard there. So we had the power disconnected at that time. Thank you. Questions from other council members? Just just one clear, Mr. Longstaff, your, your, your outcome or the goal you're, you're looking for is demolition of the property, is that correct? It, if the property could be rehabbed, that would be our first option. But in my assessment, I think rehabbing the property would be difficult, very difficult. I'm not going to say it's impossible. Um, there becomes a point where is it feasible or not, and that's the question that I have in my mind. Anything can be fixed, but at some point it doesn't become feasible to do so. Um, but I think uh, I would like to defer to uh, you know Mr. Brown and let him speak before you all come to your conclusions because I think it's only fair to hear what he has to say. I don't know what his plans for the structure are in my assessment. I think the only way to, to deal with it is, is demolition. However, I'm not the owner of the structure, and I respectfully want to make sure that uh, you all hear from the owner of the structure. Thank you. Okay. Councilor St. Clair? Um, just to ask the question, but did we have the right to turn the, the power off? I mean, I under mean, the dangerous I, building statute, we, we do. We do, yes. okay. Yes. Because just my thought is if he is going to try to rehab this facility, this house, it would be 
that's a whole other level of difficulty. We, no we can get the power it. turned back on after we've... As long as once you go out and deem it yes. safe to have it turned back yeah. on. But we do have that right to turn the power off. Yes. Okay, thank in, you. In, if, there's, if we feel there's an imminent danger there, mm -hmm. we have the right to do so. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I believe you said there was an officer. Yes, uh, Officer Brian McNeese is here. Um, he, he can briefly go through what he found on their first um, entry into the house, and uh, and then I, if there's no one else, then I believe Mr. Brown would, would be. Uh, That'll be the order okay. of proceeding. Thank you. Thank you. Officer? Okay, so on July 7th of this year, 2015, I responded to Nine Partridge Lane for a report of a possible unattended death. Um, there was a civil deputy on scene who, because of a large amount of flies and a um, strong smell of rot coming from the residence, he believed that there was possibly a unattended death. Uh, myself and another officer arrived on scene. Um, I observed the house was in um, poor condition. I could smell the strong odor of something rotting uh, from what appeared to be coming from inside the residence. Um, on windows in the kitchen area of the house, I could see a large amount of flies covering the windows. Um, we couldn't see anything, any, any body inside the residence. Uh, we walked around the residence. In the rear of the residence, I could see the second floor deck had collapsed. Uh, we attempted to make contact with the owner, um, Mr. Brown. Uh, we were unsuccessful at the time, uh, so we decided because of the stench coming from the residence, the large amount of flies we could see in the windows, we would make entry into the residence. Uh, the fire department entered the residence. Um, upon entry, they observed some ammunition and firearms boxes and due to safety reasons, uh, myself and Officer Weed put on respirators and entered the residence with the fire department. Um, when we entered, I observed a large amount of trash scattered throughout the residence. Um, inside the bathroom area, there were approximately 31 gallon jugs of what appeared to me to be urine, um, other chemicals, in the sink in the bathroom. Um, the source of the flies we found to be a stand-up freezer refrigerator with the door propped open with a large amount of meat inside that the flies were, were eating and that was found to be the source of the flies and not uh, what we thought to be an unattended death. Uh, any questions? Any questions of the officer? No, thank you. Sorry. Um, you said uh, weapons and ammunition were found on site. Any any violations of laws or codes or anything like that with, with that or was it just something that happened to be in the premises at the time? Yeah, just something that happened to be in the premises at the okay. time. Okay. Others? Mm -hmm. no? Thank you, officer. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown, uh, yes, would you uh, like to address the town council? I've made some bad choices in the last 18 months. My job is consumptive, and that house has been my warehouse. Uh, the reason the officer couldn't get me was I was on an extended business trip in Asia. I didn't get back until when I did get back, I called them. Uh, that's when I came and cleaned up. I would like the opportunity to make the place right, uh, as I said. I sacrificed a lot on my job in the last... 18 months, certainly in the last six months since I've been home. Uh, as I said, I'm not here to make excuses. I know the property is inexcusable. As I said, I'd like the opportunity to make it right. Were you aware of the efforts of uh, the zoning administrator uh, to attempt to reach you over an extended period of time? No, truthfully, sir, no. I'm just, as I said, I have... I have a job that lets me work 24 hours a day and give me more work. 
and I have sacrificed almost everything on that altar. And I recognize that that's an exceptionally poor choice to have made. Uh, do you uh, contest the uh, uh, evidence that was presented that this is a dangerous condition under the statute? Not in the slightest. Yeah. Uh, questions of other town council members? Councilor Caterina. Uh, yeah, Mr. Brown, um, do you live in that house or had you been living in it? I'm in and out of there? No. Am I there living there? No. So you have another place where you where you live? I've been staying in Freeport for the last period of time, yes. So you mentioned that you kind of <coughs> use this as, you, you called it a warehouse? It's a place. <coughs> I have a lot of things I've accumulated over the course of my period on this time. Yeah most of which are things that I would like to pass on to my children someday, furniture, those kinds of things. I need a place to keep them. I bought that house when I got divorced 18 years ago, okay. something like that. I raised my children there. They're up and gone. Uh, as I said, if I can offer you one ameliorating thing, this is that for the last, well, my daughter graduated my, since about 2012. My job, my work has been my life. And I've sacrificed everything to that. How often are, uh, up until this last 18 months, how often have you been at that property? Uh, off and on. Uh, how many times a week, let's just say? Uh, prior to the last 18 months? Yeah. Maybe four or five nights a week. And then after that, in this 18 month period, you haven't been there at all? or? I have been, the last time I was there, I've been there once since I got back from Asia in mid July. Okay. That's my only question. Other yes. and at that point you didn't see the notices on the property. It was the middle of the night. I was yeah, just yeah, badly jet lagged, overtired. And already had people on my leash looking for my time. I don't want to self aggrandize or anything like this, but I'm L L B and anti hacker. The job is consumptive and they're more than willing to make me do it. <laughs> That's not the right way to say that. Councilor St. Clair? Um, I just want to make sure I'm clear. You're, you want a chance to make this situation better. Your, your plan is to bring the house up to code, clean it out, fix it. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I'd certainly like the opportunity. Do you have a time frame? I would be willing to negotiate that with the town planning board or whatever. I would commit to a hard deadline, but at some point here we're going to get a winter. That's yeah. very true. Um, so I don't, I mean, clean up inside definitely can be done seasonally. The back deck, the physical repairs, that's going to have to wait, I think, until spring. Uh, my concern is just that you're stated that your job is. Um, pretty stressful and very intense and I'm concerned that you wouldn't have the time um, and let me just explain to you where I'm coming from I I'm all, I'm all about second chances I it's a big thing for me my concern is that you know what happens if a small child or a teenager or somebody walks through that house or something happens and you're in Asia and we let this go and nothing gets done and they fall through the floor. Mm -hmm. I'm going to feel responsible. I'm just being honest with you because I let this go. Um, so for me to be even to consider it, I would I would need some like a real plan from you. Okay. Like this is going to ha this is when this is going to happen, and my job's going to allow me to do that. How? Do you do you understand what I'm I, saying? I know I understand. I mean, what you're saying. the I mean, first part of your you're telling us you're very busy, and I totally understand that. So I just don't know how you would have the time or the capability to, to do, it's like, it would say, from what I'm seeing, an incredible undertaking. Understood. I, I, I understand what you're saying, ma'am. Um, there's a new sheriff in town. I have a new management team okay. that is swearing up and down that the crazy hours are going to stop. Uh, I have no choice but to believe them. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to believe them. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a new delivery manager. I've got a new reporting manager. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, and I genuinely want to make this right. And if I may, 
My best friend at work killed over last year with what required a double bypass to fix. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. One of my coworkers worked 41 days straight, 20 hour days, and said enough is enough. Yeah. And went to work for Maine Med. Another one of my guys, one of my teammates, chucked the whole thing and went to the bootmaker apprentice program just because he couldn't take the stress. That's kind of a wake up call for me. As I said, I'm here to tell you I've made some really poor choices on a personal level here. I'm a good, I'm a very good engineer. I'm not a very good homeowner. I'd like the chance to correct that. Well, I will say I, it's it's commendable to me to um, anybody that admits a mistake and stands in front of a group of people and and can. I mean, this is a this is a tough report. Um, I'm sure it was tough. You know what it looks like there. You know what's going on. But I'm sure it's also tough to read it in black and white. And so I, I'll always commend someone that can come forward and say that they screwed up um, and ask for a second chance. Um, uh, I just I do have a, a little still a tiny bit of concern that you're you're not going to be able to do it and and that could cause a lot of issues but I I understand I your speak. position and I can't really dispute it no I yeah I understand I, thank you uh, no, so, um, I do have a question for the gentleman but I, I do want to ask uh, through the chair um, will we have an opportunity to discuss um, the context of, um, I think it's um, in the or, or in the action it says is uh, to determine if it is a dangerous or a nuisance within the meeting and to order any appropriate action. So will that come after? At the, the conclusion of the evidence, okay, that will be the topic of I the have discussion. Some, to share with Councillor Sinclair, I have some comments around that too. Um, and I don't need details, sir. But do you have the? Re I mean, you're, mm. I mean, you're in management. You're, you know, I think a pretty sophisticated resident. Um, do you believe you have the resources available to fix this within a reasonable amount of time? My first okay. question is, being an engineer is reasonable. Uh, within three months, I'd sure like the opportunity to try. And would you be willing to be subject to uh, uh, monthly benchmarks? Absolutely, sir. I'm all about benchmarks and compliance. That's my job. <laughs> Others? Mr. Hayes. Um, just a quick question. When you say you're, you're, you know, you're willing to fix it a second chance, do you intend to do the work, or, or are you going to contract this out and have someone come in and get it? My get flippant the answer to that is yes. Yes, what? Yes, I will do some of the work myself. Yes, I will get professionals in here to do what I can't or do not have the time to do. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to commit to have it all done by professionals yes. to come in to get it up to code? I'm only hesitating because I'm of Scottish nature and <laughs> I, I understand. make financial commitment would be, you asked me to kind of to make a side on seeing financial commitment, and, but yes, I, I would prefer not to. Mm -hmm. I was raised by two carpenters, grandfathers. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. I'll look at her in a, then. Um, thank you for asking that question, um, Councilor Hayes. I, I, I'm in real estate. I'm a real estate professional. I do a lot of work with um, people who, for a better word, flip or rehab houses. Um, this house, I haven't seen it personally, um, but from the descriptions and from the pictures and whatever that I see, I will be blunt with you. I, I have concerns that you think that you can get this work done and get it done in a timely fashion by yourself. So I would lean towards a requirement that it be hired out to be done, and that's where I'm going at this point. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to lay that out for you. Thank you. Also, Ron? What's the condition of the property right now? Is it in the same condition as, as far as reported? I said, I haven't you haven't been there since long. As I said, I'm <laughs> L.O. Bean is just coming through the end of peak. They don't let us go far. I mean, I don't. I don't mm. want to make that the whole crutch here. It's my choice to work the way I do, but or I have. Um, so no, I haven't. And, uh, and so you haven't seen it since July. But what would be your expectation toward at least getting the, the refuse out of the house? Oh, I, I'll take care of that through the holidays, if not sooner. As I said, I unfortunately I go on call next week. That's the one where I can't. Like that, but which is once every five weeks. 
um, one week every five weeks. But certainly refuge, refuse, and other materials, yes, for short order business. Any other questions? Yes. So, Mr. Brown, my, my understanding is that um, letters were sent to your business in Freeport. Um, you were on assignment for them over in Asia. There was no communication between them and you while you were out in the field on their behalf that they had received no. letters on your behalf? No. It goes in a mailbox. Okay. okay. Other questions? Yes. Well, so, okay. so and I don't know how this is. Um, I don't have any questions for the gentleman. I do appreciate your honesty. I do have questions, mm -hmm. I guess, I'll, going let me backwards. Write let me, rec let me recognize you after we complete. Okay, that's Any other questions for Mr. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Yes, Counselor. Well, I have a question for staff because I'm not an expert in this by any means. You know, um, based upon the the, uh, uh, the residents' uh, willingness to to you know, right the wrong, fix this, clean this, is it reasonable based on what he has told us? Reasonable for him to be able to complete that? Um, while avoiding some of the other issues. I mean, I don't rem I, I know that we've seen pictures, um, and I'm just trying to remember the, the length of, or the depth of the uh, kind of the, the concerns. I mean, can he fix it on his own, like he's suggesting, or is this going to need to be yeah. done? In my opinion, it's a tremendous undertaking. Mm. Um, I, I would, um, as I said before, you can do anything if you have enough time and money to throw at it. At some point, it becomes a question of, is it worth it first? Is it feasible to do it? Is there going to be a return for it? Mm -hmm. I think realistically, I'm just guessing ballparking se uh, fifty to $75,000 if you're going to spend a nickel mm -hmm. just to get it back into a habitable condition. Um, you could probably tear it down, demolish it, and haul it away for 15, yep. 15 to 20. You know, so, I mean, it's... <coughs> Yeah, so I, it's hard for me to answer that question. If it were me, yeah. I would not. I would not attempt. I, I would tear it down. Yeah. And the reason why I'm asking, I can clean anything, but I can't um, pound a straight nail. <laughs> and I don't know if any, you know. So I'm trying to, you know, what to determine what is reasonable that he might be able to do on his own. And I, I have no knowledge of Mr. Brown's ability. Yeah, That's so, so it's very difficult for me to comment on that. If someone was certainly uh, <coughs> had the inclination and the experience. Um, in construction, I, I have no doubt that you could repair the building, but it's it's a complete rehab. It's not just one area of the house. The roof needs replacing. The siding needs replacing. The interior needs to be completely gutted. I don't know the condition of the wiring or the plumbing per se. Um, there's no water. There was no water in the structure. You know, no no running water in the structure. So I I think all the fixtures would have to be replaced don't know if they're frozen you know I, I, there's just no way to tell the extent uh, but my observation was it, it's a total loss if it's your property right. there's an emotional attachment just right. like the old car oh, yeah. that's rusted out and you want right. to continue to preserve it so it's hard for me to, to speak from a te you know from a technical standpoint mm -hmm. it's a complete loss it needs to be torn down if there's an emotional attachment and you have the willingness and the wherewithal to do it then, then yes, it can be repaired. Can it be repaired in three months? N absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Um, that that would not be a realistic time frame. And if that was the time frame that the council was to set for Mr. Brown, he, he you're setting him up to fail. Uh, it, it, I I can't get a phone call from the man in six months, and and so I have a real. I have a real hard time believing anything can be done in three months. You know, anything of that magnitude can be done in three months. Mm -hmm. So I think if if it's the council's, as you discuss this and deliberate, if it's your your wish to give him an opportunity to repair the structure, I think we have to be very realistic about the time frame and weigh that against what is the danger of extending that out too long. I, I do like the idea of some benchmarks or milestones that have to be met along the way so that there's some accountability. And as I talked to Mr. Brown in the hallway before the meeting, that was my biggest concern, accountability. It's one thing to say you will. Right. How, how are we, what's, what's the stick that's going to make you do it? Okay. Uh, because I, I, I hear, I, I sympathize with people. I'm a sympathetic person, but I hear, the, I hear stories all day long. And at the end of the day, this has to be resolved. I've been dealing with it for 18 months. Mm -hmm. I don't want to continue, I don't want to be back here in front of you guys 
next year at this time, still talking about this issue. It needs to be resolved. Hmm. Thank you. Here's Council Kaiser. So, Mr. Longstaff, is, I just want to be clear too. Um, my concern would be if we allowed uh, him to go back and repair that, what level would be acceptable before it would not be condemned? Because obviously, if he can't get everything done in three months, you know, uh, as long as it's structurally sound or as long as there's a roof on it and then buy more time or um, would your concern be basically full compliance with all codes finished before any kind of habitability is is a little bit objective mm -hmm. um, but first and foremost it has to be weather tight and secure mm -hmm. it has to be completely cleaned out all rubbish all human waste all household waste all hazardous waste must be remo removed from the structure. Um, those are the two musts. It has to, it, in order to be habitable, it has to have a working heating system, it has to have a working electrical system, and it has to have running water. Mm -hmm. and, it, you know, and if it has those things, I don't care if the floor is a little, you know, if the, the finishes are crumbly or paint's peeling, but mold needs to be addressed, mm -hmm. I think, from a health perspective, um, at the very least. And, and it has to be clean. So secure, clean, working systems functioning, and, uh, and then some expectation that the yard will be upkept uh, and not allow the grass to grow three feet high, and, which is a harborage for rodents and, right. and other things. So. Mm -hmm. so just to follow, if I could, please. Yes, um, and Councilor St. Clair. Um, so I don't know if you'd be willing to, to, to venture a, a, an estimate with a pro if a professional contractor came in, let's say, with a crew of five people, what kind of time frame would you expect something like that to take? If you had a crew of five people, I think, and, and you know, and, and the, uh, you know, they were committed to the job and weren't, weren't doing it piecemeal and, mm -hmm. you know, in their spare time kind of thing, if they really wanted to bang it out, I think probably... Uh, a, with a crew of five, you could probably make great headway in a month, six weeks. Okay. Um, but that's, you know, that's a crew. If you're talking about one person who wants yeah. to do it in his spare time and he's already working 24 hours a day, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm concerned for him, uh, and I'm right. concerned that it'll never get done. Thank you. Um, curious, are you, because we've, we've sort of all mentioned, you know, the standard, you know, he needs to reach certain things. Are you willing to sit down with him and kind of map out for us also as a council and for him what benchmarks he would need to hit? Because Absolutely. clearly that's not my expertise. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here on the yeah. council and say he needs to hit mm. these parameters because I don't know. <laughs> um, but are you willing at this point, I mean, like you said, when you said, I've been working on this for 18 months, I mean, there was definitely frustration in your voice, and I can completely understand that, but are you willing to maybe go a little further with this and possibly sit down with him and help him? These are where you need to be, and if you don't hit him, then, then not to sound, but then we're going to hit him. So. Yeah, I think, I think that's the only way to approach this. I think there has to be a good solid plan that's agreed to by all parties. I think there has to be some milestones or benchmarks in place. And then there has to be some penalties imposed mm -hmm. or, or, you know, right. the stick if, if right. those aren't met. Yeah, and, and that uh, was kind of my question. Are you willing to, to just still continue with this process and help maybe negotiate those? Oh, yeah. Those that's my job. Yeah. Yep. Well, I, I guess... I'm asking just because I know I could he I could hear the frustration in your voice when you mentioned oh, the 18 months. That's just my personality. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think what I'd like to uh, do is ask uh, Attorney Saucier, who's here, uh, to give us a little guidance on the legal standard that we're going to uh, uh, be asking for a motion uh, on dangerous condition uh, and the action plan that would follow. If, if you would... Uh, Proceed to the podium. I'd appreciate it. Uh, actually, before I help you with deliberations, you should probably just see if there's any other comments for the public oh, right. hearing, and, and then close the public hearing, and then we can go into deliberations. Is there anyone else in the public who would like to address this issue? None. Public hearing is closed. Thank you. You're welcome.
So thank you. I, uh, I'm not sure if you received a memo from me a few weeks ago or, or not in the packet, but I'll just briefly explain from a legal point of view what this process is, and feel free to ask, interrupt or ask any questions. The, the dangerous building statute under Maine law allows the municipal officers, in this case the town council, to abate any condition or demolish a building that is um, a dangerous or a nuisance building, is what the statute says. That's defined as um, unsafe, unsanitary, constitutes a fire hazard, is unsuitable and proper for its use or occupancy, uh, constitutes a hazard to health or safety because of inadequate maintenance, dilapidation, or abandonment. Those are some of the, the key words the legislature has given, uh, given you to help define what dangerous or nuisance means. <coughs> then you would obviously take the facts of the situation and apply that to see if it fits in any of those categories. And, um, you would now have the code officer and, and uh, health officer and, in fact, the property owner himself who, um, who appear to agree that it's a dangerous building. But that's your ultimate, find it. It's your ultimate uh, decision. If, if you do find it to be a dangerous building, then the legislature has given you the authority to um, abate it, as I mentioned, yourself, if, you, if it can be abated, or demolish it, and then recover your costs associated with that. Um, by filing a special tax, what they call it, in the Registry of Deeds. And what that means is it's treated almost like a property tax um, and that can be foreclosed upon. Mm -hmm. So that's the evidence. It's not a punitive statute. It's not a statute that allows you to give, uh, you know, fines, for example, like violating the zoning ordinance or something like that. It's really a health and, and safety statute um, that allows you to uh, deal with these kind of situations in your community um, when they get to this level. So that's the process. Um, so what you would be asked to do now that we're in the, uh, this, this part of the hearing is to deliberate on what you just heard, make some findings, and then if so, and if you do agree that it's a dangerous building, make a finding that it's, a, I'm sorry, a motion that you find it dangerous under the statute, and then secondarily what the remedy would be, whether you want it to be abated or, or, or uh, demolished. You do have the option, as been debated before, to give the property owner additional time, and in fact, that's frequently uh, what a lot of town councils do, sometimes really short periods of time, 30 days to do it or we're going in. You can give them 120 days with benchmarks. But at the end of that, if you do find it to be dangerous, I would suggest that you um, give him a period of time, but then ultimately give the town manager the authority to then go and demolish the structure um, and uh, and uh, seek uh, costs um, through the statute so that you have that because that is your ultimate authority. And if you find it to be dangerous, that's sort of the position the town would be in anyway. So that, that's the process that I, that I see, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So, uh, Councilor Saucier, is, once we've determined that it's a dangerous building, do we have a, a period where we're liable that we have to act on it on a certain amount of time or if something happens now the town because we've identified that, are we... It's a good question. I don't, I don't think you're any more liable than, than the conditions today. Well, it's, it's really just a judicial find, a quasi-judicial finding in some ways that you find it to be in this statute. If, um, if something happened there today, I think obviously the property owner would have some considerations. I don't see risk to the town at this point. There's always some risk, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I don't think it gives you any heightened <laughs> risk. You don't have ownership of the property. It's more of a adjudication, if you will. It's a there's a violation here, that sort of thing. But I would I would I would be very clear in your order what's going to happen if you do find it to be dangerous. Here are the benchmarks here, and I and I like the idea, quite frankly, of having oversight. That's something I haven't seen a lot, but I think it's a good idea. So if you have a benchmark, 120 days or something, that you have, you require periodic check-ins with the co with the uh, zoning administrator. And then there's an ultimate determination at the end of that period. I think, I was thinking through the benchmark issue, I think it's a little difficult to say, for Brian to be in the position of saying whether he is complying along the way. Um, I think it, the, clear, the cleanest way is to have benchmarks but then have a cutoff date that just now the town manager has the authority to do that because I don't want to put you in the position again of having to adjudicate whether or not uh, these conditions are satisfied. Can I follow up? Yes, um, you may. What, what kind of benchmarks would you determine them? Because obviously, you know, uh, Mr. Longstaff is the, is the expert, if you will, in that area. Um, I would assume we would defer to him for I what kind of benchmarks I would. would be required. 
yeah, um, I would defer to him as well. Okay. I would, I would work with him, uh, you know, to come up with uh, some strong language on it, but I would also defer with him on the, what the benchmarks are. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Councilor St. Clair. I just have a question, and I'm not sure um, if you, well, I'm hoping you can answer it. That big, one of the biggest concerns I have is um, the fact that there was ammunition and I believe firearms found in the home, um, a home that is publicly not tended to. Um, <coughs> is there anything that we can put into writing or into this that the, there is absolutely no weapons allowed in that home during this period of time? Because, I mean, anybody can walk into that home and now pick up a gun. I mean, we're on, we're on public TV. Um, pick up a gun and use it. So. That's a huge concern for me, and it really, really makes me uncomfortable that that house went unattended for so long and had ammunition and guns in it. Well, I think what you could do um, is, as one of your benchmarks, and I just I'm thinking on the fly a little bit here, is to have a initial benchmark of the clearing out of the property of any waste, um, you know, whatever is in there, and that could be a trigger if that's not set, for example, in 30 days. Right. You know, something more manageable that that at least the interior um, components um, the, that make it dangerous could be within 30 days. That could be a trigger that it would go right to the to demolition. If that is met, then the next one would be a longer period of the bring it up to a habitable condition, which with Brian would work with him. So that, I okay. think that's a one way to get to where you're going. Yeah. I, I might just add there yeah. could be even a, a closer benchmark that requires the property to be secured even yeah. before the inside's cleared. Yeah, right, right, right. Just yeah I think you would some belongings yeah. or. And the statute allows you to secure it immediately, and I should say that Brian has um, posted it. Um, and is it, have you secured it? Okay, you can you can order it secured tomorrow, as part of your order, um, in meaning like boarded up. Obviously, you'd have to allow access for work, but in terms of the general public, um, you could order that as an initial order. Can can we establish a uh, schedule? that would be determined by the zoning administrator by the town of Scarborough as a part of the uh, any order that we might pass tonight even though that schedule might not be uh, uh, arrived at because uh, the zoning administrator would need to speak with the homeowner uh, in an effort to uh, allow for some understanding right uh, uh, can we include such a, uh, a requirement that the town of Scarborough would set a schedule? Uh, yes, and I think to the, to the extent you can be clear tonight, I think that's a good thing. So in other words, if it's an immediate securing in 30 days to get out the dangerous materials, and then, and then the second period, the second sort of section, which is to bring it up to habitable condition, is you could sort of defer to the code officer to work with or come up with a schedule, for example, but you'd still have a cutoff date. Mm -hmm. In other words, I wouldn't want to have a lot of discretion. Uh, I want to have a cutoff date, mm -hmm. and in that interim, um, to work with the code officer. Mm -hmm. Could I just ask a question mm -hmm. of uh, Councilor uh, Is it is it possible for the council to consider this in two pieces? So tonight, having heard testimony, to make uh, to deliberate and potentially make a finding of a dangerous building, and to provide some basic guidance um, regarding what the corrective the remedy is mm -hmm. uh, after that finding is made and then to come back to you once conversation negotiation has happened and details are sorted mm -hmm. through so you actually see a concrete plan of corrective yes. action. Yes, you absolutely could. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just mm -hmm. want totally to keep mm -hmm. that in your mind as you deliberate in, um, the next two motions. Okay, thank you. Other questions of counselor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think at this point uh, what I'd like to do is uh, pass out uh, an order that was drafted uh, uh, a series of motions that were drafted by Attorney Saucier for our consideration. And I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to read them. Obviously, there's two motions, the first being uh, a finding of a dangerous condition and the second being the remedy aspect. So why don't you take a minute to read that?
So uh, just so I'm, I'm clear, um, uh, are we going to entertain the structure of the motion first, or are we going to take this as a motion and then offer amendments to it? I think probably what would be a good uh, process would be to deal with the dangerous mm -hmm. condition yeah. first. Yeah. Right. Uh, 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 put a motion on the table, uh, uh, then deliberate, uh, and once we have that resolved, then we can move, if it's a finding of a dangerous condition, to the question of remedy and how to proceed. So okay. mm -hmm. I would uh, uh, accept a motion. Uh, <coughs> and why don't I read what has been written for us? Uh, I make a motion that, based on the evidence and testimony in the record, the building located at 9 Partridge Lane in Scarborough is a dangerous and a nuisance since it is unsafe unsanitary, constitutes a fire hazard, is unsuitable or improper for the use or occupancy to which it is put, constitutes a hazard to health and safety because of inadequate maintenance, dilapidation, and abandonment. I would accept the motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, deliberation. Uh, Councilor Katerina. Uh, I, would, uh, I would definitely vote for this um, in everything that I've heard and what I've seen. And the uh, testimony of the experts, yeah. to me it's really clear that this is a dangerous building. I can only imagine what the neighbors think uh, as far as it impacts the safety and, and value and whatnot of the neighborhood. So I would definitely support uh, voting for um, making this building uh, so-called dangerous building. Thank you. Um, yeah, first, I, I really want to thank staff uh, for the due diligence and the work and the uh, thoughtfulness that was put into this. Um, this is never a, um, never an, uh, this is never a situation that anyone wants to deal with, whether it's professionally or even as a counselor. Um, it is made, I think, easier the fact that no one is um, residing at the yeah. residence, and therefore I think our action plan could be significantly uh, different and uh, less emotional. Um, I will be on, um, so as far as the motion, I completely agree with this. Um, I'll reserve, I guess, my other comments um, for the, the action plan, but I think that uh, given the testimony of our professionals and even the testimony of the, uh, the owner, um, this is definitely warranted. Yes, Councilor St. Clair. Um, I have to agree with Councilor Baby and Councilor Katerina. Um, even, even the testimony of, of um, the homeowner, he agrees that there's some real issues there. Um, but I do, um, I do think he has intentions, um, good intentions of trying to um, make better of it. Um, but at this point, I am going to agree with this motion. Thank you. Okay, so. uh, yeah, I would echo those, those comments and concerns. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize, too, that that neighborhood's fairly dense. Um, so it's not just a, an isolated building in a field somewhere or, or a, a homestead kind of <coughs> issue. It's a pretty pretty dense neighborhood with a lot of kids and a lot of families in there, so uh, I, I do think uh, it does warrant this kind of action. Other comments? I think it's pretty conclusive this is a, a dangerous problem. Uh, uh, I think the neighborhood question is a good one. This is uh, a, a terrible blight on the neighborhood. It, it is uh, an attractive nuisance mm. that uh, poses a serious risk. Uh, to drawing uh, uh, people to the building. It's not secure. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I think we should deal with it uh, uh, firmly yes. uh, while still recognizing that uh, uh, if it can be corrected uh, within a reasonable period of time, we probably will entertain those parameters. I've asked the town manager and our town attorney to look at the second motion in that regard. Uh, and so uh, I think we're ready to vote for uh, the first motion. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, I think... Uh, Just a filibuster a minute before uh, Mr. Hall gets back. <laughs> Just for the record, I, I realized that um, uh, it just didn't come up earlier, but just for the record, I wanted to note that the uh, interested parties who are required to receive notice under the statute did receive notice, and we they were required to be served, and so we did serve them under the main civil procedure rules, and we received the cards back. They just need certified mail. So I just want to put that in the record. I think you have copies of the certified mails. It was the Homeowners Association, which has a lien, and obviously in the mortgage company. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Mr. 
Register? Yes. Can I ask a question of the yes, you council? May. Council, if you would mind. Um, there is a mortgage on this property? Yes. Is there any foreclosure activity or potential foreclosure? Uh, not that we could find in the, at okay. this point. Thank yeah. you. Uh, let me uh, 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 propose uh, that I would accept a motion uh, and I will read you the language that has been uh, developed. Uh, I make a motion <clears throat> that the owner of the property be ordered to secure the property within 48 hours and further ordered <clears throat> to either demolish or rehabilitate the building to a habitable, sanitary, and secure condition and the yard area is returned to and maintained in an acceptable manner to the code enforcement officer by 120 days. <clears throat> and if the owner fails to comply with this order within that period of time, the town manager is authorized and directed to ask for bids for the demolition or abatement of such conditions and recover expenses as allowed by statute. So, so moved. Second. <clears throat> uh, I believe uh, what was uh, uh, assessed by the town manager in his discussion with the uh, town attorney is that if we can secure the building immediately, mm. uh, then the process uh, will reduce the risk to the uh, neighborhood and the community mm -hmm. uh, and allow 120 days. And at the end of the 120 days, which <clears throat> I do believe we would still agree uh, benchmarks, periodic benchmarks, would be appropriate to be set by the uh, uh, town zoning administrator. Uh, within 120 days, this, this property will either have been satisfactorily uh, put back in a reasonable condition as determined by the zoning administrator, or the town will be able to take whatever is necessary for action. Yes, Councilor. I'd like to offer an amendment. I'd like to, to uh, uh, see that the refuse and dangerous items are removed from the property within 30 days. And if that's not met, that we then have the ability to demolish the property with a trigger rather than setting a benchmark, which we may not be able to uh, take action on. Do we have a second? Second. Oh, second. Uh, discussion. Gentlemen, do you want to? I need to talk for a second. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, uh, I, I think that's reasonable. I, I, my, I don't want to say my concern, but I, I think I'd like to defer to, to, to Mr. Longstaff on what that series of events needs to be. Um, I'd like to see maybe some wording that says, that does include the word benchmarks in it to be determined by the, the planning or the code enforcement officer or something like that. My only concern would be I agree that it needs to be cleaned out, and that's a first and foremost. I think our our priority here needs to be securing the location first and foremost, no matter what. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a little less uh, inclined to start putting benchmarks in place in the process, if you know what I mean, as long as the process is completed in 120 days, as long as they can work that out or how that process is going to go, I, I'd be satisfied with that. Yes. Okay. So my, my response to that is I, I think we heard uh, uh, Councilor, uh, Town oh. Councilor, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, not one to put um, Mr. Longstaff in a position to make a determination of if significant progress is getting made, mm -hmm. but I'd like to have something to, to show that the homeowner is serious about cleaning up his property, and so I want to have a trigger in place mm -hmm. so that we could act quicker mm -hmm. um, rather than waiting the full four months. Um, and, and in terms of securing the property, I agree that that's number one priority, and I'd be comfortable with a, a period of time less than 48 hours. <coughs> And your amend motion to amend was to remove all debris, all contents? Uh, re so all unsalvageable contents within 30 days, refuse, dangerous, dangerous items. Mm -hmm. I just want to make it so it's clear. Councilor Caterina. Uh, I would definitely ag agree with this, this amendment. Um, I, again, and I'm thinking of it from a point of view of the neighbors. I mean, not only do you have house is not secure with the ammunition and guns and whatever else is in there. Uh, there's animals supposedly in there. There's whatever else. And to me, the health concerns 
to me if I were a neighbor of the possibility of rabid raccoons or mm -hmm. whatever going on there. And I do think in my own work with people who are in situations like this, and in my own past life as a social worker, say, if you can set up some pretty clear parameters for people, it makes it easier for them <coughs> to either reach them or not. And then it's very clear as to what happens next. So to me, the, the, the clearer we can make the parameters, the better. And I agree that if we set up this as, as the first parameter, that will show whether or not um, Mr. Brown is then able to take on the larger, you know, it's, it's going to be huge to make this house habitable. I mean, I just know from my own experiences. But so I would definitely support that amendment. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, Peter will recognize you next. Uh, I can see why we would not want to set uh, a, uh, uh, the obligation upon the zoning administrator to set up a schedule for do this by this by this, but to set up a schedule as described by this amendment remove all debris so the place is cleaned out the interior from a health safety point of view as a single additional condition right. seems to make some sense. Uh, Councilor Keza, then Councilor Hayes. Uh, no, I, I don't have right. a comment. Councilor Hayes. I guess where I am, and I absolutely agree with you that that's, uh, I support that amendment. The only other question I have, I'm not sure where it fits in the conversation, is just a question around is 120 days enough time to do the substantial work that needs to get done, especially during the winter. Right. Winter is going to hit. So I just want to make sure we're not setting it up for failure if there really is good intents. So I, I, I don't know how we, we address that, but I am concerned about the amount, the scope of work that needs to be done. And I would prefer to see it hired out than, you know, as oh. we've talked about. On, and I don't know if that's a condition. So I think there's some other I don't know if we want to attach those other things to some of the amendments we're talking about or not, but I am worried about 120 days mm -hmm. is a short period of time. Just for clarity, the, the latter part of that motion authorizes me uh, <coughs> to either demolish or abate such conditions. Uh, so okay. presumably okay. if significant progress or progress is <coughs> made, okay. um, oh, yeah. I'll certainly make a determination whether we should demolish it or we could cause, we could hire contractors and have further work done such to correct those code <coughs> violations. Right. Um, yeah. Councilman St. Clair. Um, I, I guess, you know, my feeling on the, um, you know, having the certain parameters to hit and stuff was just that I think, I think even Mr. Brown admitted that it's easier, going to be easier for him if he has those parameters to hit. I think that's just normal for anyone. If we have a schedule <coughs> and a deadline, if it's there, it's there. Mm -hmm. um, there are just a lot of people in this world that need to, to live by a schedule and need to have um, guidelines set up. And I, I think with something like this, um, you know, it's going to be helpful for him to have those. And if he doesn't hit them, he doesn't hit them. Um, but if he does, he does. I mean, that's, right. that's the wonderful thing about it. Um, but I, I, my biggest fear, and like I've already expressed numerous times, and I would be very aggressive with that house being secure, I would say, if it was me, Mr. Brown, I would say you've got 24, 12 hours to make sure, 12 hours to make sure that no one can get in that building. Because if anybody were to get near a firearm or ammunition, a child, an adult, um, a lunatic, um, and hurt our police department, our fire department, or a neighbor, mm. I would hold myself completely responsible for that. So I, I, would, I just want to make that extremely clear and on the record that I'm very in favor for making sure that we are extremely aggressive with that building being secure and locked up. As for the parameters, I think there's some wiggle room there and we can be as flexible. I mean, I will, I will probably go along with whatever, especially Councillor Katarina sets because she is the expert in this, um, along with our, um, the staff of the town because they, I think they've been incredibly amazing through this process. Um, but that really, I feel extremely strongly about that. Councillor Bebon. Thank you. Um, so it's really a piggy, in some way, I think uh, other councils have really touched upon a little bit of everything I kind of wanted to touch upon myself, but in different contexts. Um, 
You know, it was said earlier um, that there, you know, that the uh, owner came with good intentions. The problem that I have is that uh, sometimes good intentions is not enough to believe that something will change. Mm -hmm. um, believing is only as a result of having change been really conducted. And I'm concerned about whether or not that's going to be met. So I do agree with Councillor St. Clair that um, I think the 48 hours is extremely generous. This is to secure that property can be done in 24. I've done it before myself. You don't need to be a real estate broker to do that. Right. Uh, it's something very easy to get done, you, you know, so I, so I think that uh, while we can be concerned and um, generous, there's also a point in which we could be too generous. I also think that the 120 days is a little bit generous. Um, personally, I think that the amendment, um, that should be cleaned out within 12 hours. I mean, there's human excrement laying around, and we're getting into a time of year in which there are raccoons and whatever else, and, you know, you know all the different stuff that could happen with that type of stuff. Um, you know, I personally believe it's the end of December that should be cleaned out. You can get that done, you can hire professionals, and if the owner is truly um, <coughs> has good intentions, it will get done. And I think that once that is done, then the full scope of what needs to get done to be able to be habitable will be better understood, and whether that 90-day timeline. Um, I just want to make sure that if there is at any point that seems like the problem in the past has been cooperation by the owner, um, if there is ever any point in which there is no cooperation, that the hammer falls and that we take immediate action and um, we take care of this immediately because this, this, you know, things happen in everyone's life, but we take responsibility for it and we have to step up to it. So this is the chance for the owner to do that. I just think that the guidelines need to be a little bit stronger. Other comments? Councilor Gaza. So in, in regards to Councilor Rowan's uh, amendment, I, I, um, I think it makes sense to do that. I think it's reasonable. Um, my only concern was that it would be, um, I don't want to be too punitive. I want to give the benefit of the doubt as much we can, as we can um, without giving too much leeway. I think uh, 90 days is what was discussed by Mr. Brown uh, as reasonable. I think with winter coming, 120 is more than reasonable. Um, I think that takes into account some cushion. Um, and I think to uh, Councilor Rowan's amendment, um, we'll know within that time frame whether he's serious or not. And if he can hit that initial deadline, then I think there's opportunity to work with staff to, to be as accommodating as we can without being excessively punitive. So I, I, I think the 120 days is a good, uh, a, a good compromise because with Councillor Rowan's amendment, we have that stopgap initially to say, we'll know soon enough whether the, the homeowner is serious or not in, in making those corrections. Other comments? Uh, we are, uh, will be voting on the amendment uh, to the main motion. Uh, can, can he, can we just have, can I have clarification on what the amendment is? I think uh, that's a couple versions. Yep. What I, what I had recorded, and the clerk will correct me, is uh, that all unsalvageable contents and dangerous materials were moved within 30 days. Is that correct? Was there, I thought there was a piece about secure, no? Secure, secure the that's property. That's the primary within motion. Within 48 hours. That's in the main motion. That's in the main, in the main motion. motion, correct. Sorry, sorry. Oh, you're, that's correct. Did I accurately state your motion, Council Rowan? Second. Thank you. Uh, uh, further discussion on whether the language is adequate to, uh, 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 have the objective of having the place cleaned out right. uh, is sufficient. That's the, uh, I mean, we're doing this and uh, Councilor Roman is attempting to find language that is correct. The question is, is it adequate? Uh, uh, would you read it again? Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, I'm not exactly sure where it fits, but that all unsalvageable contents and dangerous materials be removed within 30 days. Un under penalty of? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I, to immediate demolition. So if he doesn't hit that 30 days, you're saying immediate demolition. That's, that's the trigger to allow the demolition of the property rather than waiting the full 120. Well, actually, the way the main motion is worded, yeah. you're authorizing me to make that determination. Right. It's right. not automatic right. upon that's the, that's the right. Right. But he does have the, the right to make that decision. Yes. I mean, the primary motion, he, he would yeah. have the. Yes. Yeah. It says, and if the owner fails to comply with this order within that 
that, uh, within that period of time, the, the town manager is authorized and directed to ask for bids for the demolition. Yeah, and I, if I may, I, I would just actually, um, I think it's worth you discussing the the penalty. If you notice, I actually wrote it, and I, I think there's a little confusion with a large or. In other words, I was suggesting you choose one or the other for the, whether mm -hmm. it's demolition or abatement. Mm -hmm. You may want to give the town manager that authority, but I actually think the stronger is for you to decide now uh, yeah. whether you want to abate at the end of all this, either the 30 day or the 120, oh, cool. or if you want to demolish at the end of the 30 or 120, because that also removes there's some positives to giving. Uh, the town manager some discussion, but there's also some negatives. It's, it's another decision in the process that could be potentially appealed and that sort of thing. If you make a decision now, there's a decision, and, we, and he knows what to do. He's given a directive. I so to say that could be clarified in a future amendment to the motion. I think that would be a further amendment yes, to the it motion. Would be. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, Councilor Sinclair. My only concern with that is, um, so, like, say we see, say, say at the end of that, he hasn't quite hit it. But Tom sees that he's he's close and he's making strides to do it, and then we've but we've already taken away that that choice. So then Tom's in a bind where he's like, well, he didn't actually hit it. There's he's got a couple more days work, but too bad it's you didn't hit the 30 days. So <clears throat> does that make sense? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to be too technical here, but council, <laughs> council is pointing out that it simplifies uh, the action of the town manager. Yeah, completely. But you're pointing out that the town manager may want that discretion I just, uh, yeah, uh, I wonder. because the condition of the property may be such that uh, uh, pushing it over the final uh, because we don't take the property. Yeah. It's not right. a taking. Yeah. Right. Like what do we uh, get? A, what if we uh, get a nor'easter? We recover <laughs> our costs. You know what I mean? For what we put in. Yeah. We could get so, a nor'easter next week. But but let's leave that for whether we have another motion to amend the main motion. Right now, we've got a motion to amend based on Councillor Rowan's language. So let's let's uh, uh, let's vote on that. If you're ready to vote, uh, or whether you want to have further discussion on whether that language is adequate, Councillor Case. I, I just again, sorry, I want clarity on what we're what we're authorizing if he does not comply with this amendment. What is the outcome? Is it? automatic demolition <coughs> or is it referral to the town manager for decision? Which which I, I wasn't quite sure where we landed on that. The way the main motion is worded, that it would uh, be in the hands of the town manager whether to order demolition okay. for failure to comply with the conditions <coughs> okay. uh, or to uh, undertake an order of abatement that would abate the condition. Okay. So the recourse is in the main motion, this right. is just mm -hmm. a trigger. Right. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Okay. I, uh, ready to vote? On the, main on, on the motion amendment. to amend. Motion on the motion to amend. amend. This is the motion to amend. Uh, all in favor of the motion to amend? Unanimous. Uh, I, in looking at uh, the language of the main motion as amended now, uh, it, uh, if you would look at what's in front of you, it says, the three lines from the bottom. Uh, and if the owner fails to comply with this order within that period of time, well, we have three different periods of time right. uh, 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 referenced. And so it probably wouldn't hurt to clarify what mm. we mean, that we mean a failure to meet any of the uh, designated time, uh, time limits. Mm -hmm. And so I think I would accept a... Uh, Motion to amend to clarify that point. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, we need wording. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Charlie. We'll be replacing <laughs> that with any designated period of time. Yes. Any, any of the time commitments? Any other designated uh, period, period of, time of time herein? Uh, herein. Referring to the motion itself, which has three different periods of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that was that motion uh, moved. Yes. 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 And accepted. Yes. Uh, discussion on the uh, uh, motion to amend. No. Uh, seeing none. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. 
Back to the main motion. Are there any other motions to amend? I do. Yes. Sorry. That was St. Clair. Um, and forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn. Um, I would like to make a motion to amend that the property be secured within 24 hours instead of. Second. <clears throat> Discussion on the motion to amend. I'll, I'll just please yes um, uh, because I made the motion I'll just reiterate what I've said earlier just to, obviously it's extreme concern to me that not just um, I know I'm harping on the firearms and that aspect <coughs> of it um, but there are as other counselors pointed out other um, issues as to what could happen potentially if anyone a child an adult a human, it doesn't matter who gets into that building something <coughs> could potentially happen and I know that none of us would want to see that, so that's why I think that, and I think Councillor Babine made a great point that I, I see them down in Miami and they can secure their houses in a matter of an hour when they need to when those hurricanes are coming, so I don't think 24 hours is asking too much out of anybody to secure a building. Do we, uh, Councillor Gazza? So again, I just want to be clear as well that what we're saying is because this is part of the time frames in that motion, if the building is not secured within 24 hours, we are going to take action to either demolish or remedy. I just want to be clear that's what we're yes. saying. Yes. Okay. Just to be very clear, as regards the first 24-hour notice, obviously demolish will not be accomplished in the right. near term. We would take right. efforts to secure the property secure ourselves right. first right. and foremost mm -hmm. and, and right. allow time <laughs> for proper bidding and for the work to be performed. Okay. Right. Comments on uh, the amendment uh, to uh, set 24 hours. Sounds a better enough. Good to think of my name for us. <laughs> um, I, I can go with the 24 hours also. I know, again, in my business, they secure these buildings really fast when those mortgage companies want to secure them. They get, they get secured, so yeah. let's do it. Thank you. Any further discussion? We're voting on the motion to amend uh, uh, to change it from a 48-hour uh, uh, securing of the building to 24-hour securing of the building. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is unanimous. The main motion is now back on the floor. Any further amendments? Any further discussion? Uh, Councilor Bay? I, I just want to mention, and I hope there's a consensus to this, that is that the legislative intent behind our action is that um, while we can provide leniency, we do need to take this seriously, and that um, we're hoping that um, any lack of cooperation triggers uh, the town manager having to intervene and uh, take appropriate action immediately. Certainly the spirit of our feeling. Yep. Any further uh, discussion on the main motion? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Order number 15-98. Uh, 7 p.m. public hearing in action on the following applicants who have applied for renewal of their manufactured housing communities license. <coughs> Crystal Springs Manufactured Housing Community, U.S. Route 22, Don Alexander. Pinecrest Manufactured Housing Community, uh, Teresa uh, uh, DeFosis, uh, 126 U.S. Route 1. Hillcrest Manufactured Housing, Teresa DeFosis, 126 U.S. Route 1. Uh, is there anyone in the public here who would like to speak uh, to this order? None. Is that a uh, pleasure of the council? Move approval. Move approval. Second. Second. Thank you. It's uh, recommended by the zoning administrator in his memo. Uh, yes, the zoning administrator has submitted a memo that indicates that these are all in order. Actually, not. Yes. Hillcrest and Pinecrest are, are okay. The third one, Crystal Springs, there's some infractions. And we, he's recommending that we renew it with the conditions as noted. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, do I hear a motion to amend 
uh, to incorporate the conditions uh, proposed by the zoning administrator in his December 10, 2015 motion. So moved. Second. You can certainly do that. I believe the motion that was uh, oh, provided to you already, oh. already oh, okay. considers that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, good. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Back to the main motion. Track. Yes, main motion. Discussion on the main motion. Um, I, I Councilor sorry. Thank so Sorry, um, Chairman. Um, I believe didn't they have issues? Last, is this a common occurrence? Doesn't this? I feel like this is like the fourth year. <laughs> fourth year I've heard this same situation. Is that correct, Tody? I mean, yes. yeah. So, but they always do follow through and 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 do what they're supposed to do. Correct? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Other other comments. So this is more of a question. Um, what happens if their uh, park license is not renewed because they're not compliant? Uh, are they just in a state of non-compliance until they comply, or what ramifications or, or, or repercussions are there for non-compliance? It would be penalties imposed by the uh, code office. Mm -hmm. there are penalties so there. fines typically mm -hmm. or something like that? Okay. Yes. All right. Yep. Thank you. Other comments? Ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> uh, order number 1599, 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from Susie Snowflakes Edibles, DBA Beals <laughs> Old Fashioned Ice Cream, located at 29 Gorham Road. Move approval. Second. Thank you. Uh, public hearing first. Uh, uh, is there a member of the public who would like to speak on it? Can I ask a favor? Can someone close that door? Yeah, yeah thank Please. you. Sorry, Sue. I wanted to hear everything you said. Hello, I'm Susie. Susie <laughs> I, I wanted to actually, I, most of you uh, know who I am, but I wanted to uh, introduce you to a new business owner in the town of Scarborough now. I have owned my Beals ice cream on Veranda Street in Portland since 2010. And uh, the Malia family that manufactures the Beals ice cream over in Gorham, they started in Scarborough. So it's a Scarborough family, Scarborough business, and they made it over, on, um, over at Pine Point. They're still going to be making it. They still live in Scarborough, and they wanted to make sure that uh, Scarborough had a presence, that the Beals ice cream had a presence. But they were not able to keep it open during the winter and really wanted to somehow um, make sure there was a presence there. So they approached me to purchase it. So... Um, I am the Susie and Susie Snowflakes, and my cousins called me that. I could not be called Beals Ice Cream at the state because we have to incorporate in a different name. <laughs> um, and the only other thing, the only thing I would, would say is that, you know, Portland's rules are very, very strict. I'm used to uh, following all the business licensing and all of that. But I wanted to introduce you to um, something that we think we're going to be offering in January, uh, along with the soup, it's going to be a soup and scoop, soup and scoop, and that would be Kama Supra hot soup. So I wanted to make sure you guys know uh, for $4.50, you might be able to get a bowl of soup and a um, roll, okay? And they have really good soups. This is also made in Maine, award-winning, Best Soup in New England, 2013 by Yankee Magazine, Best Soup in Portland, Portland Phoenix, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. And I don't know about 15. I don't know. Maybe somebody else is doing better <laughs> soup. I don't know what happened to 2015. But, but anyway, so um, two local companies, good, and I'm excited that I'm now a business owner, and that's all I'd like to say. Well, hopefully, if you guys give me a license. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, other uh, uh, public comment? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, the matter has been moved and seconded. Discussion? Um, Council St. Clair. I'd just like to say Sheila Malia was my first boss at the Beals in Gorham. So we go way back. <laughs> um, so I'm, a, I'm excited for you. I, um, I have a real soft spot for Beals ice cream. They're amazing people, um, the Malias, and um, they grew quite a business for themselves. And um, they're g very good-hearted people, and um, I'm excited for you to be able to grow your um, business. And even though they're already sort of here, welcome for the rest of you to Scarborough. I think it's great. Thank you. Congratulations. Other comments? Councilor 
Chasm. So uh, I, I also always encourage new business in Scarborough. I think that's wonderful. Um, I perhaps we could work something into our protocols where we'd have to do sampling first before we approve <laughs> licenses. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Further comments. So I, I happened to walk in. I happened to walk into the Beals on Saturday with my daughters, and and it was uh, first day that uh, Sue was owned the business, and so I can attest the quality of the ice cream, but the soup was not there yet. <laughs> Very good. Other comments? Congratulations. Yes. congratulations. Definitely congratulations. All set to vote. All in favor? Against? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, new business. Order 15100. A first reading and refer to the planning board for a public hearing the proposed amendments to Chapter 405 the zoning ordinance section Roman numeral 9 performance standards subsection O solar energy systems. Uh, we'll ask uh, the town planner Dan Bacon to address us to give us context to these amendments. Um, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, this zoning amendment is forwarded to you by the Long Range Planning Committee um, and it's really a, an effort to broaden the allowance for alternative energy in Scarborough um, obviously solar is, as well as wind power, but more solar is on the rise. Um, back in 2008, 2009, the council looked at this pretty comprehensively and, and back then made it clear that solar panels are allowed on homes or in backyards, et cetera. Uh, wind, tur wind turbines also uh, were sort of broadly al allowed at that time. And at that time, wind, turbine, wind, excuse me, wind turbines were allowed to be in common open space. Um, within residential subdivisions, but for whatever reason, solar panels weren't included in that allowance. Um, so this amendment is um, really to kind of to fill that void um, because solar is, is more prominent as an alternative renewable energy source and also because there's a project in town that, that wants to move forward with such installation. Uh, the Habitat for Humanity project on Broad Turn Road um, is working with uh, Revision Energy on a, on a project to put solar panels on the homes that have proper roof orientations, but there's half or more homes that don't, um, and they have some common land where they want to put freestanding solar arrays that can provide um, power supply uh, to those that can't accommodate uh, the panels on their roofs. So the Long Range Planning Committee talked about that project in particular, but then felt um, <coughs> there could be a number of other neighborhoods or other uh, common lands or common open space that that could be um, well suited for this type of um, installation. So this proposal allows um, subject to performance standards neighborhoods to have uh, these solar panels. There's performance standards around how many to, to make sure that the amount of the panels is comparable to the to the general energy consumption of the neighborhood, so it's not wouldn't be a you know a commercial insulation or a, a solar farm. It would need to be in proportion to the neighborhood, um, and also there's some standards around the siting of the panels so that they're not compromising some of the other intents of the open space. Often, open space is to to protect wetlands or to, to for other functions. So the planning board would be the authority that would kind of look at a proposal and and make sure. Um, those, the siting, you know, is, is balancing the interest of the open space and not impacting other things. So mm -hmm. that's what's before you. I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Questions for Dan Bacon? Do, do we have any indication or, or recollection of, of why the, uh, the, the freestanding wind turbines were allowed but not the solar in open space? I think it was, there was at that time in 2008, 2009, there was at least at the ordinance committee level, uh, the group that was looking at alternative energy, there was more impetus at the time for wind power, and that that was sort of a short-lived um, sort of proposition where solar has become more prominent and more feasible. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there was just more attention paid to to wind power, um, and that off that also I think there, the thinking was common open space might be needed more for wind turbines because of the height, because of needing to be in specific locations to get above the tree line, when the thinking might have been that 
most homeowners can accommodate solar panels on their properties, so that could have been part of it too. Um, but you know, I think it you know largely was an oversight as well. So. Councilor Gazan. So um, I, I noticed, that, you know, obviously with solar, it's, it's surface area and and amount of space. Um, I guess my, my real question is if you have a group array for let's say a series of three or four or five buildings, um, is there been a, um, a approach to the, I guess, return on investment type of thing? Because if you're limiting the space, the footprint from this, which would kind of override? Because if you had more energy requirements because of more buildings, let's say, tying into it, you'd need more space. So I, I know that that would be a, a, a decision that the planning board would make, but is there a restriction in here saying basically that the square footage overrides the energy consumption or vice versa. Does that make sense? Yeah, there, there isn't intended to be any square footage limitation in terms of the size of the panels in this language. Mm -hmm. um, there's intended to be a limitation in that um, the amount of panels and their forecasted energy production can't be way out of proportion with the, num with the consumption of the number of homes in the neighborhood. So that's really more the limiting factor. Um, you know, probably the more rural subdivisions, it's going to be a lot easier to accommodate the necessary solar panels because often half of the subdivision is common open space and there's a lot fewer homes per acre. So you probably can, if you clear some trees or if there's open fields, you can probably fit adequate panels. I think in the more compact neighborhoods, it might be more challenging because there might be smaller pieces of open space and a lot of a lot of homes. It might, that might be the limiting factor more than anything. It's just how much open space you have that's usable for this purpose. Does the, does the PUC treat these collective residential facilities as under the same rules that an individual home would be treated? I believe they treat it differently in that I think the PUC allows maybe up to nine or ten. You might know the answer. <laughs> Do you know that, Jean Marie? For those of you who don't know, I have solar panels on my house and I totally power my whole house, my heat, everything with solar panels. I love it. Fabulous. And even on cloudy days, believe it or not, you're generating electricity. So that's my plug for, for solar. Um, I know when I had to go through a process with my house. The PUC does not allow you to produce any more than what you can use yourself within your own household. So that's the limit, so to speak, so that they would multiply mm -hmm. that by whatever their factoring is for square footage and whatnot and usage in the house. So they don't want The question you is, does that rule for a single household uh, apply to uh, a collective. Yeah, and they have a limit on the number that they will allow to be done in a collective. I think it's and nine. Is it nine? I think it's nine. But so that's if you have 15 houses in a subdivision, they'll only allow up to, no, up to power totally. Right. So nine. This answers the question of whether people should be concerned about a commercial size application. Right. Uh, because the P PUC rule <laughs> says. Right. If you have a bank of uh, of hours of that you've built up right. solar panel hours, uh, if you don't use up that bank it within one year, C M P gets it for free. I know. So that's that's the way. So no one builds these systems in a residential setting any larger than what your normal capacity right. is. Right. Because you need to use it up every 12 months, and they show it right on the sheet they right. send you. They don't, they don't want you being a generator. And that's just what the compromise was for PUC, uh, the PUC saying that they are going to make uh, uh, the CMP give you a full credit, 15 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, and that was just a big trade-off at the time. Right. So I, I do think if, it, if it's controlled by residential rules, then it will naturally restrict its scope. When you notice that written into this new, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, okay. uh, Peter. <laughs> yeah, just a quick question. I, I, I do understand this is really early in the process, but mm -hmm. have you had any type of public feedback about, you know, I mean, I can imagine some of these green spaces where there may be competing uses for that space. <coughs> that solar arrays are usually not, are not the most attractive 
things in a neighborhood. Have, have you had much feedback from any? And I'm sure this will come out in the public hearing, but that would yeah. be my concern about would would re other residents be concerned about sort of the aesthetics and what that means in the neighborhoods? Yeah, we we haven't had feedback. We haven't had broad outreach yeah. yet. It's it's this is a kind of a broader amendment. It's not specific to a part of town, so it's a little bit harder to to get widespread feedback. Um, I think that for existing neighborhoods that have common open space, uh, in many cases that open space is owned by collectively by a homeowner's association. So um, in most cases, there needs to be majority agreement yeah. within an association before such a project could move forward. Um, and you know, kind of looking forward, if, if this is approved and new projects come in, then and that's something a developer wants to incorporate as part of the project, then the, the homeowners are going to be aware of that and maybe buying in or not buying in based yeah. on that. Um, but really the only conversations we've had outside Long Range Planning Committee at this point has been with Habitat, who's yeah. the yeah. first one that wants to utilize it. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so I just want to be clear, we're talking about freestanding solar arrays, not roof-mounted arrays. That's a separate... That's a separate installation because your house is, right. Councilor Katarina, is, is roof mounted. Mm -hmm. right. um, and is, are, I don't believe there are any restrictions in terms of individual roof mountings in terms of the number per unit. So if there's 20 homes in a development and all 20 want solar panels on their roof, as long as they're within the zoning requirements of height and things like that, then it's acceptable. Correct. Right now that's right. allowed. Um, and if you have the right roof, you can do as many as you can fit, um, subject to PUC. Yep. Right. Um, and I think there's some potential for PUC standards, hopefully, to change in terms of the tightness around um, solar panels that are inside common open space or on a property that maybe can be generating for, um, you know, users off the property. But I think to answer your earlier question, I think it's nine. I think the energy production using solar panels on a lot can be transferred up to not to nine different properties or different owners so in the case of common open space maybe there can be games played with how many lots that is but if there's an open space over here could serve maybe nine properties within the neighborhood maybe there's open space over there that's suitable could serve another nine so I believe that's the current limitation at the PUC other questions for Dan Thank you, Dan. Sure. Uh, any member of the public who would like to speak to uh, this matter? Close the public hearing. Uh, uh, move approval. What's your pleasure? Second. Move approval. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, discussion. Councilor Bayline. Yeah, so um, again, this is uh, another opportunity. I brought this up at the, la I think it was the last meeting when we talked about changes to other ordinances. <laughs> As part of the planning board's recommendation, or at least the review, I'd like to seek um, the opinion of either the planning department or even the planning board. Um, you know, I have this uh, thought that I'm just going to stick to. <laughs> and um, what I'm concerned about is that I want to make sure that when we're thinking outside the box and we're changing ordinances, that there's an evaluative process that goes back to the comprehensive plan and determines is that change consistent with the comprehensive plan, and if not, what do we do to mitigate any public concern around that? And so um, this could be something, and of course you never know whether or not something is going to be accepted by the public um, until, they be, until we make a decision and then there is some type of activity. So I would just like to, um, and for me it really becomes more of a standard practice that when we start these type of changes, um, including contract zones, you know, um, take a look at the comprehensive plan and making sure that we're being consistent. And if it is, if it can be highlighted, because uh, it supports the work that a lot of people did. And if it's not, then we make some type of recommendation to change the comprehensive plan that allows it to be consistent. So if that can be part of the evaluative process, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Katarina. Uh, yeah, this was thoroughly vetted uh, through the Long Ranch Planning uh, Commission, um, and that did come up. But uh, comprehensive plan, we are coming up <coughs> to time to do another comprehensive plan within the next couple of years. Um, there was a lot of support on this, and as you know, this will be going to the planning board for the public hearing. Yes. 
Um, so it will get a lot of it will get a lot of public attention. Other comments? This is a. Uh, uh, also, Hayes. Yeah, I, I guess I guess you know, kind of follow up on my earlier comments and some of the comments. I, I'll support this moment, but but I am very interested in the public comment that does come out of this, and it will be really interested to see what folks have to say about this. So we'll yeah. support it for now, but absolutely. We're ready to uh, uh, vote. Mm -hmm. all, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, order number 15101, uh, act on the request from the Shellfish Commission to approve the allocations of shellfish licenses for 2016. Ask uh, the town manager to uh, introduce this matter. Yes, as an annual uh, matter, uh, the town is asked to provide guidance. Actually, the uh, Department of Marine Resources is the one who approves and makes final determination on type and allocation of licenses. Uh, in Scarborough situation, we do have a shellfish commission created by this council, uh, and they are largely deferred these, these matters to consider. I do see two members, perhaps three members of the shellfish commission in attendance tonight, including uh, the, the chairman. Uh, perhaps they can offer further guidance. I would offer, though, uh, we are aware that uh, our, these allocation decisions have been submitted to DMR. We have received notice back that they are acceptable. Um, perhaps they have other input they'd like to provide. Thank you. Councilor Hayes, uh, any comments at this point? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I sit as a liaison to the group, and I, I've been really impressed by the process they've gone through. They've had many discussions about this, and it was really kind of interesting to watch the process because they had a diversity of opinion, they have a diversity of folks, and they really did a great job of kind of sitting and listening to each other and finding some middle ground, that, which is what they're recommending. And I think some of the folks will probably talk about it, but I really compliment them. It was really, a, a, it, was, it, was, it was rewarding to kind of watch that process where they, they really, they had, there were different views in the room and lots of good reasons, and they shared a lot of information, and I feel very comfortable with the recommendation they arrived at. So Thank you. Really compliment them. If any member of the Shellfish Commission would like to uh, address this order, uh, please feel free to do so at this time. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Robert Willett. I'm the chairman on the Scarborough Shellfish Committee. Um, we had a 7 to 0 vote on recommending uh, keeping the license numbers the same as 2015. Um, we did that through public testimony and, and facts and, and uh, information that was submitted to the committee. And then we discussed it and, and came up with our decision. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Other members? Good evening, uh, members of the council. My name is Dave Green. Uh, I'm also a member of the Scarborough Shellfish Committee. I'm not here to speak as a member of the committee. I am a commercial clamor and very proud of it. Uh, as Mr. Hayes can attest to, uh, what, what happened at our last meeting last Tuesday night uh, was a lot of pulling of hair and gnashing of teeth. Uh, as he said, there was a great difference of view as to whether we should increase license numbers or keep them the same. And one thing that we, I guess we didn't see the forest through the trees, that we also could have decreased the numbers through attrition. And I'm going to make four points with you because I'm, I'm sure a lot of you don't quite understand what's going on out here on our flats in this town. We have four issues with our clam population out here. The first one being an invasive species of crab known as the green crabs. We, we have conservation projects that we are trying to address that, but it's uh, kind of like trying to hold the tide back when it's ready to come. Mother Nature's done an awful good job of introducing green crabs to us. So we are uh, a bit stuck with those to a point. The second thing that we have is milky ribbon worms. Um, I almost wish I'd have brought some pictures for you to see. <laughs> but these worms literally are, are three and four feet long. Oh, no. They are a voracious predator of clams. 
and they are becoming to the point that they are outnumbering the clams when you go dig. Hmm. You will pull more worms out than you will clams. So we're up against that, and we're trying to come up with some uh, ways of dealing with those. Uh, the third thing is ocean acidification. As you probably read, Press Herald had a pretty good article about some of that. Uh, that uh, we're going to look into how we can address that also. And the fourth thing is the clam is ourselves. We're, we're the biggest predator of clams out on the flats, okay? Uh, and as far as I'm concerned personally, I'm not speaking for the committee, we have too many licenses in this town already. And that comes from back in the good days when we had lots of clams, very few predators. One thing that we don't do as a shellfish committee or as a town is we don't take anybody's license away because we think we have too many now five years after we had tons of clams five years ago. We don't have tons of clams today. So as a committee, we opted to uh, keep the numbers the same, but personally, I believe we should probably cut them by five, and I'm not saying that we're going to take anybody's license. We would do that most likely through attrition, um, but we, we are definitely up against the eight ball with our clam population in this town right now. We have a lot of seed, but you can't count your chickens before they hatch, okay? Many, many things. The poor little clam out there on the flats, he's on the bottom of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. Food chain starts with the clams, so everything eats the clams. So that's why we elected not to increase any numbers. We would love to have 100 clam licenses in town, but we can't support that because we have 42 commercial diggers who have all taken a beating this year financially because they are probably digging half of what they dug three years ago. And that's a hard way to, to survive when you have a family and a mortgage like everyone else and you're subject to Mother Nature. So that's why we opted to do what we did. Uh, and I, I do believe possibly next year at the same time you, you may be hearing that uh, we would like to see those numbers possibly go down only through attrition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green, and pass along our best wishes and holiday greetings to your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> anyone, else, uh, <laughs> anyone else from the public who would like to address uh, this issue? Seeing none, close the public session. Uh, discussion. Start at the end and we'll move down. So two real quick questions, and Peter, maybe you can help me with this one. Um, uh, the first one is, has the Department of Marine Resources ever not approved our license allotment? Or are they pretty much they've just, always they've always approved it. Okay, so they're not, I, I want to say they're not restricting it or overseeing it. They're, they're trusting that what we're doing is suffic sufficient and accurate to maintain our own, our own stocks. Is that fair? It's fair, but I think a lot of it has to do with the right. amount of involvement DMR has of with course. the commission and the confidence they have in the work they do. Right. So I, I'm just saying that they, they would leave that up to us to determine whether we need to reduce licensing or something like that to a certain extent. They wouldn't step yeah. in and say, we don't feel like you can, your flats can support this many. We want you to restrict you. They have that authority, I know, but they've right. never done that in the past. They have, an, and a lot of it has to do with the fact yeah. that it's science-based. It's based okay. on surveys and other uh, experiential type things. And the second question, if I could, um, these uh, milky ribbon worms, do they have any commercial value at all, whether it be bait or it, nothing? They're useless. Uh, okay. Mm. I like green crabs. Councilor St. Clair. I can't talk after that. Milky <laughs> ribbon. Oh, jeez. I'm going to have nightmares. Um, I just wanted to thank you for both of you for coming in. I, I can honestly say that, you know, a lot of times um, we sit up here and we, we get a lot of the same stuff and we go through it. And, um, but I, I love when I can get even a, even a sliver of an education from something that you're doing. And, um, you know, I think um, our, the fishermen in this town and, 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 you, and you guys, I, people don't understand how hard you work. And like you said, your population is dwindling and yet you still have a mortgage and a family and things like that. So anytime that you can come in here and even if it's about the milky ribbon worm, um, I'll still take the education because I think it's really important for people to 
understand what you are up against, and it's a lot. So thank you. Other comments? Councilor Katerina? Yeah, I, I just want to thank the members of the Shellfish, I can't even talk, Shellfish Commission, say that fast three times, um, for the work <coughs> that I know all of you do. Uh, I depend on, you know, the information that you folks bring back to us because I'm not a clamor, I've never been a clamor, uh, don't plan to be a clamor. Um, but yeah, that worm, I've heard about that worm and it's really disgusting. And my, my assumption, I know there's some stuff going on in Augusta, particularly the o ocean acidification, um, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you guys are staying on top of all those developments and legislation and whatever. Uh, going on up there, and I would certainly, I support whatever, they're the experts, we aren't, and whatever they feel that needs to happen, I'm happy to support that, so. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. So I want to also echo my appreciation for you guys coming in tonight. Uh, the questions that I had uh, about this when I was reading my, my uh, materials was about the sustainability of the harvest, and I think what what uh, Mr. Green was, was mentioning was really very alarming in terms of if the, the catch is falling, uh, you know, in half in three years, that's very concerning. I'm very concerned about the health of the, that harvest. And, um, but, the, you know, the commission brought this forward 7-0, so I mean, it sounds like that's the appropriate number this year anyway. Thank you. Um, believe it or not, I have a close connection to clamors. My grandfather was a clamor. My father actually was a DMR biologist who used to go around testing clam flats or uh, red for red tide, not the flats itself. Yeah, flats. I was really young. So I can tell you all kinds of stories about uh, the old <laughs> days. And I've just shared it with the committee when I was their liaison <laughs> and to know a few of the older guys. Um, I have an incredible amount of respect for the work that they do and the dialogue that they have and the discussion. Um, so I hope that the question I have isn't taken out of context. Where, because there's always been this balance of um, we get the prof we get the professional mm -hmm. recommendation of the diggers, then we have the liaison's interpretation of that work that's done. The one piece that's missing, and it's the first time missing, is the um, marine resource officer who isn't here. Um, uh, how is um, the professionals on the staff side? Uh, I, obviously, they're in agreement that this is the right number. We usually have Dave Corbo, who's here to say th this is exactly what we need to do. Um, has staff kind of looked at that and said, yes, this is good? I I'm not aware that staff's been involved in this and particular conversation, okay. uh, but I, I think we can rest comfortably the, the fact that DMR has looked at it. Um, okay. And Dave has always worked very, very closely with them. So I, I will say just uh, we're very close to having a new. That's the real answer I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we expect that person to be starting the first week or so uh, of the new year. Yep. Other comments? Uh, I think it goes without saying that if there was something as a municipality that we could do to support uh, and protect against these predators, mm. we'd want to hear it from you so mm. that we could make an attempt. I get the impression that this is much larger than the town of Scarborough, uh, and that's... Uh, uh, so it is in the hands of the state. Uh, any further comments? Uh, all in favor? I'm not sure if there was a motion made. There wasn't a motion made. Oh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, move, let's move rectify that. that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, befo and before we do, any other members of the public? Uh, Seeing none, uh, uh, what's your pleasure? Uh, move so approval. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Any further comments? <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> you get distracted <laughs> by shiny, <laughs> blingy things. <laughs> uh, <coughs> order number 15102, act on the request from the deputy tax collector for a waiver of foreclosure on the following properties. Uh, 4 David Drive, map T003, uh, lot 004, 20 Crystal Lane, map T003, light 020, <coughs> and 332 Garnet Drive, map T002, lot 332, 29 Matthews Way, map T003, lot 029, and authorize the town manager to sign the necessary documentation. Uh, town, manager will, town manager will introduce this matter. 
Yes. Um, this time every year, actually the 23rd of this month, foreclosures uh, will be automatic. These are for taxes that are 18 months old at this point that have gone through the uh, required lien and notice process. Uh, these particular properties, and again, I, I, I should back up, main law uh, is very specific and some might say cruel in that foreclosure is automatic. Um, the council must take action such as what you're considering tonight to stop it. Uh, the reason that these properties are singled out from the others is that these are all manufactured homes um, of a certain age and condition that they're really not of value to us. In fact, uh, they might be a liability. Uh, they sit on leased land and so it's uh, fairly routine. We look at these fairly carefully and it's not uncommon. In fact, most years uh, a similar request is made for the council to consider. Uh, public comment. Anyone who would like to address this matter, please approach the podium. Seeing none, close public comment. Uh, what's your pleasure? Move approval. approval. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Uh, discussion. Councilman Kaiser. So um, I, I appreciate that explanation from um, uh, from Mr. Paul. Uh, is there still a a lien on the property as well so that the taxes are recovered if it is sold or if yes certainly I beg yeah, okay. your pardon I neglected to say that liens okay. stay in place and so the town's interest by way of unpaid uh, taxes is, is still in place okay thank you other comments my, my assumption being right. my assumption being that uh, we don't want these things that they're probably not going to bring much uh -huh. we're probably not going to see the money It, it does happen. Uh, these items are sold, um, so I, I, I still hold out hope, and we have to, uh, <laughs> liens are secured. Yeah, unnecessary to embroil ourselves in uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. high risk, low ret low return uh, matter. So this is probably appropriate. Any further comments? Mm -hmm. Just Councilor Road. Just a curiosity. How do how do we make that determination? Just the and who on staff? Does, do we look at them? Do we, how do well, we because the tax bill has been generated, we have an assessed value of the, uh, of the manufactured home, uh, and it's typically uh, very low value, mm -hmm. the older ones. Yeah. Uh, I guess the other thing, just to keep in mind, low value means low tax amount. So we're not talking about huge sums of money here. Um, really, the headaches associated with owning this uh, far outweigh um, the tax value at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other comments? None. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, <clears throat> Order 15103, uh, act on the request to accept the following donations to the police department in the amount of $17,750 and to the fire department in the amount of $15,000. I'll ask the town manager to introduce this matter. Yes, we have a very generous uh, town resident who made a basic inquiry to both police and fire departments as to whether they had any items that they'd been considering uh, but for whatever reason they could not fit into their budget uh, and uh, I think gratefully both chiefs accepted the invitation and came up with a list of uh, nice to have things if you will uh, and they're both here in attendance tonight I'd really like to defer to them to perhaps describe their intended use of these funds uh, if that is the council. Very good uh, we have both chiefs in attendance and uh, like to hear from them uh, on this and thank you for your patience this has been a long evening uh, <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't noticed. <laughs> yes the family uh, is uh, Sue and Jim Conkle they, they don't do this for the publicity but uh, certainly we're very appreciative uh, this is not the first gift that they have made a donation that they've made they assisted us with some AV equipment and smart boards in the public safety building uh, back last spring uh, they actually have donated a house that both police and fire have made extensive use out of and training that is eventually going to be used in a live training burn uh, sometime next spring or summer. Uh, and the fire department gift, this most recent gift, was to purchase three of the um, their kits that go for our rapid intervention team uh, with emergency air ball supplies. So if one of our firefighters runs out of air inside a building, we bring this kit in with us with a specialized team, we can plug that uh, supply air into their existing masks so that uh, we can make that rescue an effective rescue. So uh, just very appreciative of the relationship that we built with the Conkles and, and most appreciative of their very generous gift.
Thank you. Uh, as, as Mike said, uh, very nice folks um, and, and obviously very generous. And, and uh, they did ask that we put together something of a, a list of things that we wouldn't normally ask for or didn't have the opportunity to have. So for the police department's part, uh, uh, we were looking at some uh, push-to-talk wireless headsets. Uh, one of the things that we found with the uh, folks in the dispatch area is, is that it can get very noisy and that noise carries forward out onto the, out of the radios and so forth, background noise. Um, so we had looked at uh, some wireless headsets that they could use that are, are specific built for that purpose so that they're not interfering with each other and so that they can get up and walk around and they've got, uh, got close communications. They have the microphones right near them so it's not picking up all the background. Um, we're also looking at uh, a video uh, retrieval uh, system. Many of the stores, as you know now, have, uh, have uh, cameras and, and video and so forth, and oftentimes we're called upon that to, to use that for evidence. One of the problems that we have is with, that when we go to, to get the evidence off from those uh, recorders, some of them are not the best quality, and we have to take things off on a, on a stick or, or a chip or something. And, uh, and because of the size of some of these things, they have to uh, reduce the size of the image that they're, the video that they're taking, so the quality is diminished. And this system would be something that they could go right into a store and plug into the back of the store's uh, uh, DVR um, or recording system and, and download right to it and bring it without hefting to downsize and, and diminish the quality. The uh, third thing that we were looking at was a Segway, a patrol-specific built Segway. Um, as you, we talked about, uh, the enhanced hours at, at Higgins Beach and so forth, uh, and the ability for an officer now to go down onto the actual beach area as a, and, and the roadways, something that would do both. Um, so we would like to uh, incorporate this. It's a um, you've probably seen them. They make a police model. It's got a bigger tire for, for actually going onto the beach and so forth. It's an electric uh, rig, um, very, very visible. They can stand up and they can uh, kind of quickly get, uh, get around, and we think it would be a useful tool at the beaches. Uh, the the uh, third thing is uh, is a drone, and I, I say that and wait for the gas, but I realize that that's a, I realize that that's a very controversial issue. Um, but I want to assure you that uh, w this is not intended for any investigative type uh, operations or surveillance or, or anything of the sort. I'm looking at this as uh, strictly a life safety um, type piece of equipment. I think. Uh, when I, we have a, we have a special needs program where we have uh, people, children, and, and folks that are on the uh, on the spectrum, and uh, we also have Alzheimer's patients and so forth that we register. Many of the uh, many of the uh, folks that are on the spectrum are attracted to water, and we have many ponds and different things. So uh, should a child go missing or should a person go missing? Um, usually we only have three officers out, probably only one in that area, so to, to get to those different bodies of water and so forth to quickly check would, uh, would take some scrambling. My thought is, is that if we had something like this that we could put up and check those areas. Um, another example, we had a situation last summer with a lost child on Pine Point Beach. And if you look at the beach from the jetty down to Old Orchard, that's a, that's a lot of area to cover in a hurry. Um, so. Again, something like that, uh, you know, we would put up, run down the beach, see if, uh, see if we could locate. We also have uh, a lot of distress, distress calls, boats and swimmers and surfboards and things that are, are in distress or could be in distress. And again, we thought uh, while, while the fire department and the rescue folks are launching the boats and getting the equipment all ready and so forth, being able to go out and pinpoint and find out if there really is a problem uh, would be to, to all of our advantage as well. I also think uh, probably there are situations where the SWAT team is involved in certain situations, whether they're barricaded uh, situations uh, or whatever the case may be, where it would be certainly a safety issue for, the, for both the uh, officers and also for people in the surrounding area. So um, we recognize that uh, there is a law that, uh, that uh, just took effect here, I think in October, and it requires um, policy that meets a variety of standards. 
I've been in contact with the director of the academy. Those standards are being worked on now. The, poly the model policy will be coming out probably in February. I have no intent of purchasing or, or anything until uh, until the policy is in place and until we're assured that uh, everything's done that needs to be done. So, Thank happy to answer you. any questions on any of those. Any questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, uh, we uh, we will have a policy in place before the purchase is made. We're here tonight to accept the donation of the money uh, and uh, rules can uh, address the rules and policies as uh, as they as the model uh, rules are are put out. So, uh, uh, what's your pleasure? So moved. Oh. <laughs> Second. Thank you. Uh, Comments, questions, deliberation on this matter. I would Comments. like I would like to thank this uh, very. Um, I can't even talk. Generous family Sweet. for making this donation um, to our uh, police department and fire department. I know as a both as a citizen of the town and a taxpayer, I I certainly appreciate their generosity. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I, I too want to express my appreciation to the Conkles. I think it's incredibly generous and it's a recurring generosity and I'm, I'm wondering if there's some way, I, I know they're not seeking publicity or notoriety or anything, I'm wondering if there's some way that the town can express its appreciation via some form of, you know, very discreet uh, acknowledgement or appreciation. Thank you. Other comments? <coughs> so, um, as well, you know, generosity from people sometimes goes unnoticed, and so I think it's really important that we do recognize whenever possible and whenever uh, it's warranted. You know, there's a lot of um, conversation in the world about um, things that are donated by people with good intentions, and I'm thinking really at a bigger level where this criticism about municipalities receiving um, military-style donations from the federal government of their equipment and and um, I just think that this is a perfect example. It's about the administration of that donation after the fact. It's not restricting the donation, but it's how you administer it and having good people like our two chiefs and having reasonable policies and rules that, that go around that that the community can support. So um, I'm really pleased with the donation. Thank you. Uh, I, I will just say that uh, over the weekend, I uh, learned more about uh, statutory authority for drones than I <laughs> thought I would uh, ever have, but uh, my good friend Craig Friedrich uh, raised <laughs> the questions uh, about uh, uh, all of it, and we very quickly, he found the statute, which is only a few months old, uh, passed this past summer and took effect in October, so we all learned quite a bit. Again, thank you, Craig. So, uh, Any further comments? Uh, all, in uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Non-action items now. Uh, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, let's start down here at Councilor Bay. Thank you. Um, really brief updates because uh, we're just getting started really in the new year, uh, the new calendar year for the councils. So, um, as a, a delegate to SEDCO, SEDCO will have the first meeting of um, our new calendar year tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. I'm sure it will be a full agenda. Um, I wanted to mention that 4 o'clock tomorrow is also Eco Maine's uh, meeting, which um, thankfully Mike Shar, our second delegate, will be in attendance, and I won't because I have a conflict with a finance committee meeting. Um, but we're moving forward, and my goal is that there will be some type of annual report that will be coming out of them. Uh, to our council since we are a significant contributor and owner within Ecomain um, in the new year as well. I um, wanted to mention that on finance, there's really two initiatives underway around finance in the beginning stages. First, um, so to uh, report on really what has been created last year that will carry forward is our joint effort with the school board. We're having a, what I will call a, a committee chairman's meeting tomorrow with our uh, respective managers to start beginning planning for the new year. Um, the go that is actually, um, I think, scheduled at 3.30, right, Tom, just to yes. confirm? And that's really to kind of Jody Shea, who is the Finance Committee Chair on the school board side, and I will meet with Tom and George uh, to talk about really about the planning session going forward, 
um, establishing um, guideline, ba the baseline of what happened last year as the new baseline for this year, um, with the real goal of, of covering what is the uh, uh, what is the timeline and the schedule, because I know that's an extremely important issue for many people. I will mention, although not yet approved, it appears that there may be consensus that that joint meeting on a regular basis will meet on the second and fourth Thursday of every month, starting in January at 3 p.m. Again, I'll confirm and uh, relay that information to each of you. And then I wanted to also mention that the Town's Finance Committee um, will um, tentatively, again, we haven't formally approved it, but I believe I have consensus from the other two, on the second and fourth Wednesdays of every month at 3 p.m. And our first meeting um, we would like to have possibly next uh, Wednesday on the 23rd. It will be a short session really to wrap up 2015's um, determinations and have a conversation of uh, really planning for the new year and getting our initiatives out there. Um, hoping it really isn't more than an hour or two, but we have to confirm that with the manager and his schedule first. <coughs> and um, wanted to mention the library trustees um, um, have gotten great welcome from them, and I want to thank <laughs> every one of them who have contacted me. I, I'm taking a behind-the-scenes tour of the library next Wednesday. And just to mention their meetings, board meetings, are the third Thursday of each month as well. And the Eastern Trail, I'm just not caught up to speed on yet, and I'll talk <laughs> about that later. Councilor Rowan. Thank you. Uh, so a big day for me tomorrow. We have uh, first said co meeting at, at uh, 730 and then uh, senior advisor who are on the alternate uh, at 9. And then I have the Housing Alliance and tomorrow evening. Uh, so <laughs> I'll have a better idea. <laughs> Talk to me tomorrow. Uh, uh, I also have not had a chance to reach out to the uh, ADA advisory committee where I'm also um, uh, liaison. But I did get a chance to meet with uh, Mr. The before Mr. mentioned uh, Eagle Eyes uh, Friedrich, um, <laughs> and uh, he gave me a great background on the Historical Preservation and Implementation oh. Committee. Um, I think that uh, one of the, the um, points that he wanted to highlight was that we have a number of um, historic cemeteries around town that are in a state of neglect, and uh, we're looking for uh, members of the community that may be interested in, in um, uh, helping tend those uh, around their homes. Um, uh, maybe possibly one initiative was it was a, a Girl Scout project for one mm. particular cemetery recently. Um, so if you if you know of anyone, there there are um, there's definitely a need there. Um, the other thing to highlight is the uh, I believe that uh, Mr. Hall has reported uh, about the Danish Village Arch that's mm -hmm. now Memorial Park. It looks terrific, um, and that, that we're we're shooting for a dedication ceremony in the spring. Councilor Caterina. Yeah, um, a few things. We met this week, a uh, small working group, uh, and uh, Council Rowan is involved with it also on broadband internet. And looking at what we're looking at right now is where do we have broadband in town? Uh, as far as you know, the uh, dark, so-called dark fiber. That sounds so spooky, but anyway, <laughs> what, what they call it. Uh, and take it, we've got uh, Sedco, Karen Martin through Sedco is got some something going on with Tilson Technologies who does um, surveying and figuring out what communities needs are and what where it's available and whatnot. So we're just w really starting to lay the groundwork as to where is it, how can how can it help with uh, economic development and how much um, involvement the municipality wants to have in it. Um, so that was this week and we're meeting again in January. Uh, Conservation Commission, those poor guys are missing me, but I, I am coming back now. My class on Monday nights is now all done, but they have involved me and they are going to be coming before the town council probably the end of January, beginning of February. They've been working on a so-called, I guess you'd call it a white paper, as to uh, potential effects of storm damage, climate change and whatnot. Um, and and how vulnerable Scarborough really is. It's a little interesting when you look. It's more than interesting. It's a little scary when you look at uh, if we ever had a storm like we had in 1978, blizzard. I think all of you will probably remember that. Um, it could do some real damage in Scarborough today mm -hmm. because of the increases in, in ocean levels and whatnot. Um, 
I did go over to Scarborough Fish and Game. I hadn't been there in a bit and tried a little bit of trap shooting. Don't ask me what my score was. It wasn't very good. But I did talk to some of the uh, the guys over there and let them know that I'm the new liaison to them. And, of course, they were like, oh. <laughs> um, so that, that was good. Um, ordinance. We don't have anything at the moment. I'll just remind all of you that if you have anything you want brought before ordinance committee, <laughs> let me know by the end of the year. Obviously, it's an ongoing process. Things will come up. You're going to have constituents or whoever want us to examine. But what I've done is I have reserved the third Tuesday of the month. So it's the Tuesday before the second town council meeting um, at 4 p.m. And I will let people know if we've got anything on board or not. But I do have that uh, set aside um, so the public will know. Uh, long range planning, nothing this month. We've pushed it back. Uh, Chamber of Commerce is Monday. And regretfully, I have to go to a luncheon for top producers at my company. I've got to brag a little bit. Uh, so I'm sending Bill uh, in my stead. but. I, I won't be catching up with them also after this. That's it for me. Councilor St. Clair. Uh, yeah, uh, the appointments committee met tonight um, or this afternoon well before our workshop. Um, we have a pretty extensive list and we actually had to table a couple. So I'm going to, instead of reading them all off, if it's okay with you, Tody, I'm going to give copies to you and Bill and then we need to go over a couple of them. Is that sufficient or do I need to read all of them? You we read it into the record. <laughs> okay, it's there's a lot. Is that okay? You guys okay? I mean it's, you tell me what to do. <laughs> yes? Read it read the whole thing. Okay. Wrong one, sorry. Okay. Board of Assessment Review. Um, we have Kathy Fuente and Matthew Chamberlain as full voting members. Their term is will expire in twenty eighteen. Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee, Timothy Downs and Robert Willette as full voting members, terms to expire in 2018. Community Services and Rec Advisory Board, um, I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing, of course. Richard Murphy um, as a full voting member, his term is going to expire in 2018. We're going to move Robert, do I need to do all those two? Robert, Roger. Oh, oh Rich, no, Robert. Oh, it says Robert. I'm sorry. It said Robert, but it's Roger Chabot from first alternate, to first alternate to a full voting member. He will expire in 2016. We're going to move Liam Summers from second alternate to first alternate, and his term expires in 2016. And we're going to appoint <laughs> Donna Marie Collins as second alternate term to expire in 2018. Sorry, I am trying to do this too fast, I think. Um, Conservation Commission. Um, J. Antoine Boudoir as a full voting member, term to expire in 2018. Um, and Richard, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, I wrote too Rachel. fast. Rachel. 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 I think it's Henderson, isn't Hendrickson. it? Hendrickson. 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 With a term to expire in 2018. Um, we still have an opening in that, right, on that one. Oh, and then... Um, we're still an opening on that? Yes. Yeah. I have a list. Liaison, so well, I have a list too that I can give you at the end. Um, the employee incentive program is going to be Ed Blaze, shocker, as a full voting member, term to expire in 2018. Um, the energy committee, sorry, I'm trying to make sure I line up everything to make sure that I don't skip anybody. Okay. Energy committee is um, Rick. Mike, can you pronounce it? Miking. Um, and David Kin Kirsten and Ronald Allen as full voting members. Their terms expire in 2018. Um, Housing Alliance is Suzanne Foley Ferguson um, as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2018. I told you it was a long one. I'm sorry. Not on that one. Uh, uh, not on Housing Alliance. There's only one on Housing Alliance. I thought he was the extra one we added in. Was a late, uh, yeah, he was the late one I thought we added in. Yeah, yes, you're right. Okay. It's sorry. sorry. <laughs> it's not on my cheat sheet. See what happens? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be open and honest. I'm cheating. <laughs> um, yes, we did. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. We did add, add um, a late person on that one, and he's right. Housing Alliance. 
And I already lost it again. I'm losing it tonight. Robert Porter. Robert Porter. And he will have a full term, so 2018. Right? Okay. Sorry about that. So now we're back to Parks and Conservation. Um, Paul Austin and Rachel Hendrickson as full voting members. They have full terms to expire in 2018. Personnel Appeals Board is John, I mean, J. Antoine Bodar again, and Sandra Alquist. They're both coming back as full voting members with terms to expire in 2018. Planning Board, um, Corey Fellows is going to continue on um, with his term to expire in 2018. We're going to move Susan August from first alternate to a full voting member. Her term is ex actually ex expires in 2016. We move Roger Bealey from second alternate to first alternate with a term to expire in 2017. And we're going to put Robin Saunders as um, second alternate with a term to expire in 2018. Um, pest management, I want to make sure I'm getting everybody. Pest management advisory board, um, we have Tim Lindsay and Marla Zando as full voting members. They are going to have 2018 expiration. I almost said expiration dates. That wouldn't be right to say, I don't think. <laughs> Sorry. Starting to get punchy. Senior Advisory Board, um, I have Troy Hendrickson and Penny Bowles as full voting members with terms to expire in 2018. Um, we did table the Shellfish Conservation Commission. Um, that was tabled for tonight because um, it was complicated and we ran out of time. We had to get to our meeting. Um, we did get to the Zoning Board of Appeals and it's going to be um, Leroy Crockett with a term to expire in 2018. And we're going to move Mr. Stanhope from first alternate to full voting member with a term to expire in 2016. Move Mr. Herbert from second alternate to first alternate with a term to expire in 2016. And Ed Blaze as second alternate with a term to expire in 2018. I apologize for any mistakes I may have had. <laughs> You can't have that. I have to rewrite it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make it neater. Okay, is that all right? I'm really sorry. <laughs> Even with a cheat sheet, Toady, I still screwed up. <laughs> Peter. Yeah, good evening. Um, I think we've already talked about the Shellfish C Conservation Committee that met. We talked about licenses and the other liaison on. We have the Transportation Committee that met and there's lots of projects going on. There was an update on sort of the Gorham Road improvement project mm -hmm. that is a pretty extensive project that kind of extends from the school all the way down to Payne Road. There's five sort of different zones and they're looking at not only resurfacing the road but also putting in some bike and multi-use paths. So that, that will be something that will be future conversations. Um, talked a little bit about some of the plans around doing some Pine Point Road updates, especially from the new bridge down to, mm. you know, bridge. down to the beach. Um, talked about some conversations around maybe considering putting bus shelters in about five locations up and down sort of Route 1. Mm -hmm. um, and actually fixing or taking a look at the pedestrian crossing that's down by the Hannaford Plaza where mm -hmm. it comes out by. There's, there's mm -hmm. some real issues about that. Um, and the perpetual conversation continues to be looking at Winnix Neck Road and a quiet zone for the trains. Oh, yeah. um, but that's become, as usual, and you're dealing with federal regulations and other things, a complicated yeah. issue. So those are just kind of a sample of things going on. But thank you, Will, for bailing me out tomorrow with, with the senior. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you <got it> <laughs> thank you, Chris. Uh, so, uh, two things. The, the, I guess the biggest thing, which I, I would imagine most of the town has heard this already, um, but uh, Dr. Entwistle has announced his retirement from the school board, or excuse me, from the school department, um, effective June 30th. Uh, the school board is meeting tomorrow for a workshop to discuss the process that they're going to do for the, the uh, upcoming superintendent's search. Um, and I will certainly keep the, the council abreast of how that works out, whether we're, we're um, having a representation or asked to, to comment on that process. Um, Energy Committee met this morning. Um, they're preparing the trash management report for presentation to the council. This is what the agenda says, but there's, it's, it's maybe something a little more glamorous that uh, the recycling and, and, and uh, waste resource management proposals and recommendations they're going to make. Um, some very, very good discussions around options. So I think the report that comes in front of the council will be very thorough and, and, and very uh, informative. 
Uh, we also looked at the uh, solar panel zoning amendment that we passed this evening. We, we did a, a cursory look through that real quick. Um, uh, and we had a couple of things that, uh, because of the discussions around the trash management report, we put off until the next meeting. Um, one is to discuss um, a program called Star Communities that we'll be looking at exploring and I'll have more information hopefully by the end of the next meeting uh, of what, what that entails and also the potential for um, new LED street lighting program that's coming out through um, I believe it's the PUC and efficiency main Tom if I'm not mistaken um, uh, with options for the town to look at potentials for replacement or um, uh, installation of new new street lights um, so uh, next meeting for energy is scheduled uh, January 21st. Hopefully we'll have that report wrapped up and the presentation ready for the council, I believe sometime in February. And we're scheduled to come in, come in front and, and discuss that. And obviously school board will be meeting tomorrow night, so I'll have more information report on that as well. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I attended uh, the energy committee meeting with Chris today as I handed off uh, to him. Uh, it's a great group, great working group. Uh, they've worked very hard on the uh, uh, municipal solid waste analysis. Uh, we are probably looking at a workshop in uh, February. Right now that's where town manager and I are, are booking out to for, uh, for workshops and we'll provide more information on that uh, in the weeks ahead. Good. Uh, town manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of quick points of interest. Um, just want to relate, uh, you know, the council met and did its goal process uh, this evening. I just want to relate, uh, through my senior staff, for lack of a better term, we've been doing some strategic planning or at least strategic talking, and we've come up with a couple of focus areas, and the two areas are first set around communication, and you'd be pleased to hear that. That was certainly a major theme of yours. Uh, and also the other one is staff development and succession planning, some really kind of nuts and bolts uh, organi organizational pieces. But there really, you know, clearly is some commonality around communications. Uh, there's also the vision committee that's working with this whole committee summit, talking about the same sort of thing. So I think perhaps the stars are aligning that we can actually make some uh, headway this year. So I'm, I'm encouraged about that. I want to relate for the public, uh, we received notice that uh, Project Country Club is doing some stabilization work mm -hmm. on the Black Rock Road. Uh, this is the area that extends as you're standing in the parking lot at Ferry Beach, the beach down to the right. Black Rock Road runs along the top oh, of the yeah. bluff there and it's experienced some pretty significant erosion issues. Um, I mention that because they have chosen to close that portion of the beach uh, as a construction site and there's no entry during that period of that time. They do own that area and it's certainly within their rights. Uh, but uh, many residents do choose to uh, recreate in that area, but they won't be able to in the near term. Uh, pleased to mention uh, our further interest and support of the Habitat Project. Mm -hmm. We've been able to come up with four different work dates for town staff. Uh, there'll be there's ample opportunities as we move forward, but uh, in the months of January and February, we have two dates in each of those months where 20, a crew of 20 staff or so are going to be there for either a morning or an afternoon. So very excited about the interest shown by at the staff level and hopefully that's going to be something that we can do for years to come frankly can you share those dates with the yeah. council sure yep i'll send that out um just another point of interest uh, we haven't finalized this but as uh, the public may be aware town hall closes normally at four o'clock but for wednesdays that's our late night 6 30. Uh, the amount of activity that happens here is is very sporadic and sometimes almost non-existent. So we're considering perhaps dropping back to two times a month on council evening nights. We uh, we stay open to 6.30 and I appreciate that that's an important thing for folks that are working. Uh, with proper notice, we'd like to try that, <coughs> see how accepted uh, that is. Uh, so we'll get some notice out before we do anything, certainly. And lastly, just housekeeping uh, with the Christmas Day holiday approaching. Of course, Christmas Day is Friday, town hall is closed, and we'll be shutting down town hall at 2 o'clock on Christmas Eve, the 24th. Again, uh, reopening uh, for business normal hours on Monday the 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Council member comments. Let's start at this end. Uh, so um, 
I, I did want to thank uh, my fellow counselors for their involvement in the workshop this afternoon. I think, it, or this evening, I should say. Um, it's a lot of hard work. I think we're 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 putting good effort into it, and I think it's genuine effort. Um, and uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for their participation and involvement. And I thought it was very, very brief, but time very well spent. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing that process through with us. Uh, I also wanted to let um, people know that uh, some of us attended the United Way uh, Community Forum, for lack of a better, to, to look at goals for the um, greater Portland area in terms of uh, the type of community we wanted to see and some. Uh, some actions that we could take um, to, to try and get there. Uh, it was a pretty diverse group of people and uh, talked about a lot of issues for communication and, and trying to reach across uh, silos for various community committees and town committees and things like that and, and, and some action items maybe to try and move forward. So I, I want to thank um, uh, uh, certainly the United Way for, for hosting that and looking forward to participating in that again. Um, uh, this will be the last time we meet before the um, Christmas break, so I wanted to say happy holidays to everybody, and I, I hope everybody has a very safe and joyous holiday, whatever they may practice. And um, looking forward to picking up again uh, in January when we come back. Thank you. I guess I'll be brief, just you know, as, as it is the end of the year, just happy holidays to all, yeah. and look forward to next year. Thanks, everyone. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I've talked enough. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, just very quickly, I just want to again uh, call attention to Operation Hope. Um, we had uh, quite a bit of publicity recently on the legislative level, also. Uh, I know Office. Uh, oh, I'm demoting you. <laughs> Chief Bolton and Officer Gill went up to the legislature and met with all the legislative leaders and is I think that I know from what I've people I've talked to that uh, what we've been doing here in Skyro has had a big 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 impact on the fact that the legislature is actually going to look at doing something finally with treatment at least in addition to the enforcement piece so thank you very much for that um, I remind people of Project Grace and the Fuel Assistance Program. I know it's been really warm and they're predicting it's going to be 60 degrees on Christmas Day, but that's going to change. <laughs> there are people in town who struggle with heating their homes, so please don't forget that. And again, uh, and Operation Hope also could use some cash if they don't take any taxpayer money. Uh, and Project Grace acts as the fiduciary for them, so if you're looking for great Christmas presents, for people who already have everything, don't need anything else, make donations to for those would be fabulous. I also would like to thank the United Way. I went to that meeting and it was it was very interesting and uh, it was great conversations. We had great conversations there. And I will uh, wish people a happy holiday, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Hanukkah is over. I'm not sure what else is celebrated this time at Saturnalia, for those of us who are Latin teachers. Um, and I will see you next year. So thank you. Councilor Rowan. Um, so I wanted to express a, a thank you to uh, Sue and Jim Conkle for the generous donation to the Fire and Police Department. Uh, I also wanted to thank um, Chief Moulton uh, for bringing up uh, Project Lifesaver. This was the, um, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, program that he referenced in terms of uh, monitoring individuals with disabilities, and it's a project that's near and dear to my heart with a, a daughter with special needs. Um, I also wanted to highlight that uh, something that I found out recently was that we have a, a town email newsletter and you can sign up on the website uh, and, and have uh, a newsletter delivered. Um, I also had the opportunity to join the United Way uh, community conversation and I wanted to thank uh, Jim Elkins for hosting that. Um, I also wanted to express that I really appreciate the indulgence of the council as I tilt at windmills and try and understand the uh, <laughs> state education <laughs> subsidy, and um, certainly any guidance that can be offered to me well, if you uh, figure is it out, totally, I'm, I will. I'm going to get know. to the bottom of this. Okay. I, I, I can smell that we are missing money, and I'm going to find it. <laughs> so we have that to look forward to. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, I also had an opportunity to get a get an introduction to the IT department here in the in the basement, uh, which uh, I felt very comfortable uh, with that discussion, and we we had a. I think a very productive meeting about uh, potential um, 
ways that we can address a lack of broadband mm -hmm. coverage in, in town, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing to work on that. Um, uh, there was another interesting article today, which I will share with yeah. all of you, which was brought to my attention. Um, and then lastly, uh, again, happy holidays, and I hope everyone has a safe and happy New Year. Thank you. Um, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. Um, hope everyone has a joyous New Year. Um, I'll be honest, I actually forgot that next week is uh, Christmas. Um, so if it indulges the rest of the finance committee, I really want to I want to go ahead and cancel next week's uh, meeting uh, for, incle for inclement weather. <laughs> um, I don't know. I've just been really busy. I forgot that it was next week. Um, so I apologize. It was my early April Fool's Day joke, I guess. Um, um, I did want to mention, um, you know, um, there's been a lot of focus and attention on Project Hope that is extremely positive, that is becoming really the baseline for other communities to uh, come up with their own program. Um, and I think that it really is credit to our employees and to our chief and to the community as a whole for accepting it and really promoting it. Um, the secondary piece of that, though, I think that needs to be focused in on is that, and there was a couple of articles in the paper recently about um, pretty significant, uh, um, for lack of a better term, drug busts or um, you know, people who have been arrested as a result of investigations, and I think that the community should be commended for that as well. Not only the police for the work that they do, but it really does take neighbors paying attention yeah. in their neighborhood on what is going on um, so that they can um, react appropriately and find these type of people who, um, you know, it's hard to believe that Scarborough has people who sell drugs out of their homes and, and doing illegal things. You know, we all want to think that there's no way on earth it happens in Scarborough, but it's proof it is. So I really, there was a really good article about one particular neighborhood, um, and um, I actually know quite a few of the people in that neighborhood, and it was because of the neighbors paying attention that made a difference, and, you know, they should be thanked for what they, what they contributed to that process. And last, I really just want to say, um, you know, thank you for the workshop. I think that, um, and it's really both workshops, and it's a commitment, um, and that's about the council setting its goals and having that beginning dialogue. Um, it's really what we take next out of that that's going to be important for the community to understand why we went through that exercise um, and then really providing deliverables. And I'm, I, I am really excited about that work. I think it's, um, um, it's going to be a worthwhile and I hope becomes a baseline for a new council even going forward for the next 10 years, things that we haven't done in the past. So I really appreciate that effort very much and I'll reserve other comments for later when I need to. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the the goals workshops really were quite successful and and we've started out and I think really the proof is in the pudding the dialogue has been as good as I've seen it in the two years that I've been on the council uh, the courtesy uh, that is being shown I really I'm very pleased with the way we're starting I think this can be a very hard-working uh, council and a lot of good interaction a lot of respect for each other uh, uh, I do want to indicate that sometimes when public uh, members of the public uh, go to the podium and they ask a question, they're, they're, it really begs for an answer. And I want people to realize that we are not going to just sit here and hear it and then have it go away, because that's the impression sometimes you can get. And so while we don't want to engage in a dialogue with people who, and we do want to give them the opportunity to make public comment, but where there is an easy answer, I'm going to encourage any member of town council just pass me a note and, and take a shot at it at the end of the public comment period. Mm -hmm. A little bit different, we'll see if it works, but uh, I think uh, trying to have the public understand that we're responsive to, to their concerns, uh, no matter how small they are, is very important. Uh, uh, I want to uh, 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 offer congratulations uh, and best wishes to Dr. Entwistle on his retirement. Uh, he, his energy and skill and, and passionate advocacy for the school system was is really remarkable. Uh, uh, he is he can be a tremendous foe on budgets, uh, but no one has worked harder for our school system than that gentleman, and and he deserves uh, our uh, expression of appreciation. So with that, I think. Uh, to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you.